name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Today is the third month, the 27th day in the year 2016. And, uh, oh, it's also Resurrection Day. Christ is truly risen. Hallelujah. And don't let the apostate Jews and anyone else lie to you. Christ is truly risen. As a matter of fact, I just spoke with him this morning. The lecture, the, this season's lecture is titled, Non-Catholics Cannot Hold Offices in the Catholic Church. It sounds pretty simple, and it really is. The dogma really comes down to this. It's a deeper dogma, but it comes down to this. Unless you're a Catholic and a member of the Catholic Church, you can't hold an office in the Catholic Church. It's as simple as that. You're going to learn, and it's a very, very important dogma. It goes all the way back to the beginning of the church on Pentecost Day. It's an ordinary magisterium dogma taught by the apostles, who are the first church fathers, and all the following church fathers unanimously teach that anybody who falls away from the faith, non-Catholics, cannot hold offices in the Catholic Church. You're going to learn that here. And it's also been infallibly defined by popes, so it's also part of the solemn magisterium. Before I begin this lecture, I'd like to just make a statement to the people that are listening to this. If you, after you've looked at the evidence I have on the uh, great apostasy, which began in the 11th century, and against the Vatican II Church, so we're talking about the Renaissance Church and the Vatican II Church, and you still call these apostate anti-popes uh, uh, orthodox, and you don't denounce them as idolaters and heretics, well then you're an idolater and you're a heretic, and the very least you have to do that. You may not know about the deeper dogma that they can't hold offices. I'm going to teach that to you now. I taught it to you before. It's out there. A lot of people are teaching it. But I'm going to give you the, the, the true teaching on it. The, not everyone's teaching this thing completely the right way. But the main point I'm making right here is after you look at that evidence, and you look at what these monsters are doing, and you still want to call them Catholics, and you don't denounce them as heretics and idolaters, Turn off the lecture right now, because this lecture is not for you. Because you're a fool, you're a heretic, you're, a, you're a, uh, an idolater, and our Lord says wisdom does not dwell in a soul subject to sin, and our Lord says do not talk with a fool, go not after him because he, uh, he, because he makes no sense. So don't even, I'm not on, this is not for you people, okay? If after you looked at the evidence, and you still want to call these apostate anti-popes, Catholics, and not idolaters and heretics. Second point I want to make is, if you acknowledge that they're idolaters and heretics, that they've been committing monstrous crimes against the faith, and you don't want to have these teachings handed to you on a platter from God, that guess what? This, these guys aren't popes, and you want them to be true popes, turn off the video also. I say that because in the beginning, the hardest problem I had when I came to realize that apostate anti-pope John Paul II was teaching all these heresies and horrible crimes against the faith, I didn't have the deeper dogma that, I, that they lose their office, and so I thought he was the pope. My biggest conflict was there then that. How could he be the pope? How could he be the Holy Father? How could I call him Holy Father? It was tormenting me, really. And then when I found the teachings that this guy's, guess what, he's not the Pope, it's a teaching in the church that anybody who's like that cannot hold an office, he's an anti-Pope, I praised God. I was looking for it in my heart, and when I found it, I embraced it. That's my point. So if you want these people to be Popes, even, even though you believe they're idolaters and heretics, turn off the video. It's not for you. It's not for you. Common sense and the natural law would tell anybody who has a little bit of goodwill that, my God, my Lord, how can somebody who commits all these crimes against the faith, allow pedophilia and all this stuff, still be a holy father and a pope and rule your church on earth? So for those people, just turn the video off. For all the rest of you, keep the video on, and we're going to go on with the lecture now. And we're going to teach you about that deeper dogma that non-Catholics cannot hold offices in the Catholic Church. Now I'm going to start out with a summary of all the dogmas that are taught or touched upon in this lecture. And all, I, all these things are dogmas right here. And we're just, this, everything that's going to be covered is right here. This is going to be fit to go into my catechism, the, mass, the catechism when we were finished with it. First, a non-Catholic cannot hold an office in a Catholic church. Two, a heretic is a baptized person who doubts or denies a dogma or commits a heretical act by sins of omission, commission, or association. Three, a former heretic is guilty of the mortal sin of heresy and thus is not Catholic. Therefore, a Catholic who becomes a former heretic is automatically excommunicated from the Catholic Church and thus no longer Catholic. Four, 
Because a former heretic is not Catholic, he cannot hold an office in the Catholic Church. Hence, a Catholic office holder who becomes a formal heretic is no longer Catholic and thus automatically loses his office. A nominal Catholic who was a formal heretic before he was elected or appointed to an office does not obtain the office because he was not Catholic. 5. A Catholic who is a material heretic is not guilty of the mortal sin of heresy and thus is Catholic. However, he must be treated as a formal heretic until he proves his innocence due to inculpable ignorance and abjures his heresy. 6. A Catholic office holder who is a material heretic still holds the office. However, he must be treated as a formal heretic and thus denounced as a formal heretic and a non-office holder avoided in religious matters and his name removed from the diptychs and tegetor prayer to mass until he proves his innocence due to inculpable ignorance and abjures his heresy, at which point it would then be known that he was not guilty and thus was Catholic and hence still holds the office. 7. Therefore, a so-called Catholic office holder who is a heretic, whether a formal heretic or a material heretic, must be treated as a formal heretic and thus denounced as a formal heretic and a non-office holder, avoided in religious matters, in his name, removed from the diptychs and tegetor prayer to mass. 8. A nominal Catholic who doubts or denies a basic dogma is a formal heretic or catechumen, and thus not Catholic. He cannot be excused by inculpable ignorance. Therefore, a nominal Catholic who doubts or denies a basic dogma cannot hold an office in a Catholic church because he is not Catholic. 9. A so-called Catholic who doubts or denies a deeper dogma is a formal heretic if he is culpable or a material heretic if he is not culpable. 10. Because the Pope is subject to the dogmas of the Catholic Church and is an office holder, all that has been said above, just said, regarding heretics and office holders also applies to a pope. 11. The Apostolic See is the Papacy, also known as the Roman See, or the First See. The Apostolic See consists of all the valid acts of the popes and is free from all error and all sin, and thus cannot be judged by anyone on earth. This is the meaning of the dogma that the First See cannot be judged by anyone on earth. 12. Any papal act that is illegal, erroneous, or sinful is invalid, null and void, and thus not part of the apostolic see, not part of the first see. Hence, illegal, erroneous, or sinful papal acts must be condemned and disobeyed. 13. When the pope obstinately sins, he must be juridically judged, that is, judged, sentenced, and punished, just like any other sinner. The sinful pope is being juridically judged, not in his capacity as the pope, but as a sinner. We're going to now show you where the ordinary magisterium teaches the dog, but that non-Catholics cannot hold offices in the Catholic Church. The ordinary magisterium is the, teach, the unanimous teachings of the church fathers on faith and morals. The apostles were the first church fathers, and also it includes the holy prophets and all the Old Testament uh, testimonies. We're going to first quote the church father, the holy prophet Ezekiel, from Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 9. And when the prophet shall err and speak a word, I will stretch forth my hand upon him and cut him off from the midst of my people Israel, when he shall err. And the prophet of prophets, is what the pope is considered the, uh, like a prophet, the main prophet in the Catholic Church, just like the high priest was back then. And then your, your bishops were prophets too, teachers of the faith. The church father uh, O.C., the holy prophet O.C. says in O.C. 4.6, My people have been silent because they have had no knowledge, and because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will reject thee, and thou shalt no longer do the office of priesthood to me. No longer do the office of priesthood to me because you've rejected knowledge. And he's, talking, he's not talking about how to build a house or how to plow a field. He's talking about the knowledge of the faith. And because you do not have the faith, you are, I reject you. From the priesthood, from the bishop ranks, and from offices. Their church father, St. Paul, says in 1 Corinthians 4, 1-2, 
Let a man so account of us, of the ministers of Christ, and the dispensers of the mysteries of God. Here now is required among the dispensers that a man be found faithful. So if he's not faithful, he cannot be a dispenser of the word of God. He cannot be a bishop and hold an office or be a teacher. He has no authority in the church if he's not faithful. Ch the church follows St. Paul says in Galatians 1, 8, 8, But though we, bishops, or an angel from heaven, who's even greater than a pope, preach a gospel besides which we have preached unto you, let him be anantema, condemned, excommunicated, ousted, avoided in religious matters. There you go. And he's talking about bishops there, office holders, and even an angel from heaven who's greater than the pope. Now we're reading from the church father, St. Cyprian, in his letter 74 to Magnus in the 3rd century. No heretics and schismatics at all have any power or right. We're now reading from the church father, St. Optatus, Bishop of Milvies, against Parmenian or against the Donatists. And this is circa 372. His book 1, part 10, it says section 10 in here. Therefore, None of the heretics possess either the keys, which Peter alone received, or the ring, with which we read that the fountain has been sealed, nor is any heretic one of those to whom the garden belongs, in which God plants his young trees. And this is part 12 here. Rightly hast thou closed the garden to heretics. Rightly hast thou claimed the keys for Peter. Rightly hast thou denied the right of cultivating the young trees to those who are certainly shut out from the garden and from the paradise of God. Rightly hast thou withdrawn the ring from those to whom it is not allowed to open the fountain. Basically, heretics are not inside the Catholic Church, so they have no power and authority in the Catholic Church, or no office or no rights. That's what he's saying. Now you're going to learn about this from the Solemn Magisterium. Solemn Magisterium are the infallible papal definitions. All right, and from the information I have, the first time it was infallibly defined that uh, office holders who become heretics uh, or lose their offices, automatically lose their offices, is from the Council of Ephesus in 431. It could have been taught earlier, but this is from the information I have. Now the council was called by Pope St. Celestine in 431, but he died before it was confirmed, and the next pope, Pope St. Sixtus III, confirmed it in 432. Now, this mainly took up the heresy of Nestorius, who denied that Jesus Christ was truly God. He believed he re really was only man. And so he believed Mary was not the mother of God, because he didn't believe Jesus Christ was truly God and man. He was only man. And the Spirit of God dwelled in him, but he was not really God and man. So that's why he came out with that heresy, that Mary is not the mother of God. He's, he's notorious for that heresy. It's, it's Arianism, and he held this, and this, this, the, this is the main business this council took up to condemn him. And, it, and he was a bishop, all right? And, it's, this is, and when you see what the church did regarding to him and anybody else who holds an office, this is where we learn about how they can't hold offices in the Catholic Church. And we're going to read from the judgment against him in the Council of Ephesus, in, and this is called the part called the Judgment Against Nestorius. If any metropolitan of a province descends from the holy and ecumenical synod and attaches himself to the assembly of the revolters, or should do so later, or should have adopted the opinions of Salistius, who held the same opinions as Nestorius, or do so in the future, such a one is deprived of all power to take steps against bishops of his province. He thereby is cast out by the synod from all ecclesiastical communion and is deprived of all ecclesiastical authority, even those in the future who should hold this heresy. They're cast out of the Catholic Church, deprived of all ecclesiastical authority. Instead, he's, he is to be subjected to the bishops of his own province and the surrounding metropolitans, provided they be orthodox, even to the extent of being completely deposed from the rank of bishop. That, so what he's saying is they automatically lose their power, they're automatically excommunicated, and they're even worthy of being deposed from the rank of bishop. That's called degradation. And for that, they would need a condemnatory sentence from the neighboring bishops. But the loss of office is automatic. Anybody who just believes like him, he's saying. This is repeated in, in, in Canon 4 of the Council of Ephesus. But if some of the clergy should rebel and dare to hold the opinions of Nestorius or Celsius, either private or public, if he has, it has been judged by the Holy Synod that they too are deposed 
or deposed, lose their offices. Gone, you're out. If you hold it, you're deposed. Canon 6, we read in the Council of Ephesus. Likewise, if any should in any way attempt to set aside the orders in each case made by the Holy Synod of Ephesus, the Holy Synod decrees that if they be bishops or clergymen, they shall absolutely forfeit their offices. If a layman, they shall be excommunicated. Now, when they forfeit their office, excommunication goes along with that. And if it's a layman, he would just be excommunicated because he doesn't have an office. All right, now, we're going to show you where, uh, when Nestorius became a heretic, he started to excommunicate the Orthodox bishops and attack them. All right, so... Uh, a year before the Council of Ephesus, in the year 430, the Pope St. Stelestein was writing letters about the stories because he already knew he was a heretic. Not only declaring him to be a heretic, but I'm going to read the letters to you in a second. It was a letter to the bishops of Constantinople and a bishop to uh, John, the bishop of Antioch. And in those two letters, he's stating that from the moment Nestorius manifested his heresy. It was then known that he has no power, he has no authority, he has no office, he, he is no longer has the office, he's gone. And he teaches this in the year 430. And this is proven, though, it's automatic. This is before there's any official declaration against him anyway. Ephesus gave an official declaration against him, but it was a declaratory sentence. When, you, when they do that, it's for the common good. Hey, he's deposed. But as you just read in the council, it says they're automatically deposed. And anybody comes along and believes like them, he's already deposed. There doesn't need to be a trial, a sentence, or a declaration from a judge. This is what this is going to prove when I read it to you right here. This is Pope St. Celestine's letter to the clergy of Constantinople in the year 430. The authority of R.C. has expressly defined that no one, whether bishop or cleric, or private Christian, who has been deprived either of place or communion by Nestorius, or others like him, since the Nestorius and his followers began to preach such things, such heresies, heresy, are really so deprived. They're not deprived, in other words. He has no power to deprive you of yourself. For he could, ne here's Nestorius, for he could neither depose nor remove anyone who himself in preaching such things has left his position of safety, has lost his office. He no longer has the power and authority in the office. We, now, he says the same thing in a little bit different way to uh, his letter to John, Bishop of Antioch, in uh, the year 430. So he wrote both these letters on the same day, the eighth month and eleventh day. He says, The authority of our apostolic see is determined that the bishop, clerk, or simple Christian who has been deposed or ex excommunicated by Nestorius or his fathers, after the latter began to preach heresy, shall not be considered deposed or excommunicated. For he who had, had defected from the faith with such preachings cannot depose or remove anyone whatsoever. He has no power, he has no authority, he has no jurisdiction, he has no office. And this is the way the church has always treated people when they came out and taught heresies. You're going to learn about this uh, very powerfully now in another dogma of the church. It's a deeper dogma, but it's a dogma that when, uh, when you go to Mass in the TGT or prayer, and we read, we pray for the Pope, we pray for the local bishop. Back then, they used to have diptychs, and on diptychs, they would put the names of the Pope, the local bishop, the metropolitan, and uh, the, the princes, the Catholic princes, and they would pray for them in the Mass. But they would put them on diptychs. And if any one of those bishops, or even a Pope, or even any, any or a priest, or, and you pray for your local priest too, was a heretic, as soon as he was a heretic, before any sentence, trial or declaration, and you knew he was a heretic, you'd have to remove him from the diptychs because he's a heretic. You can't pray for him in the Mass because that prayer also is a prayer of communion. You're stating that you're in communion with the Pope, you're in communion with the Bishop, you're in communion with the priest. So if your Bishop becomes a heretic, he's automatically excommunicated. Or if he's a material heretic, he's presumed to be automatically excommunicated, treated the same way. You can't pray for him because you're not in religious communion with him. You're not allowed to be in religious communion with them. So they remove them from the diptychs. They remove them from the teaching Torah prayer to Mass. This has been a practice historically of the church right from the beginning of Pentecost Day. I'm going to go over some examples about this here. First, we're going to read about the diptychs from an article in the Ecclesiastical Review uh, from 1890. It says, The diptychs tablets uh, on one of which are inscribed the names of the Pope and the patriarchs and the bishops, who govern the various churches, and on the, and, and on the other, the names of those who died in communion with the church. And we read from the Missali Mixtum, the purpose and chief use of the diptychs 
was to retain Catholic communion, both of the living with one another and the living with the dead. And we're reading from the Fathers of the Church, edited by the apostate Roy J. D. Ferrari from 1955. The practice of commemorating the names of the living and the dead, civil officials and clerics, martyrs and confessors, the faithful departed was well established long before Augustine's time. Names were sometimes inscribed, uh, inscribed on ornate tablets of wood, metal, or ivory called diptychs, which, where the list was long, a book was used. Okay? Now, we're going to give you an example here. We're going to read also here now from the Acts of the Council of Chalcedon. This is a it was translated in notes by Richard Pr uh, Price and Michael Gaudis, 2005. This is their just definition of what diptychs are. This isn't in the council itself, but he gives a good definition of the diptychs. He says, lists of names of the living and the dead read out at the Eucharist. We do it now in the TG Tor prayer. The removal of names of living bishops was the standard way of breaking off communion with them. So if they became heretics or schismatics, you, gotta, you, you remove them from the diptychs. And many times this was done before there was any trial or declaration. Oh, oh, it's enough for you to know he's a heretic. We're, gonna, we're now going to quote from Pope St. Hermisdas in his Libellus Professionis Fidei in the year 517. And this was an infallible document, but the names of those separated from the communion of the Catholic Church, that is, those not agreeing with the apostolic see, shall not be read during the sacred mysteries. All you got to know is he doesn't agree with the faith. He's, he's, he's opposing an article of faith. He's doubting or denying a dogma, either word or deeds. The nominal Catholic Encyclopedia says, under the article Diptych, the liturgical use of the diptychs offers considerable interest. In the early Christian ages, it was customary to write on diptychs the names of those, living or dead, who were considered as members of the church, a signal evidence of the doctrine of the communion of saints. The diptychs of the living would include names of the pope, bishops, and illustrious persons, both lay and ecclesiastical, or of the benefactors of a church, and of those who offered the holy sacrifice. To these names are sometimes added those of the Blessed Virgin, of martyrs, and of other saints. Whatever their immediate purpose, the liturgical diptychs admitted only the names of persons in communion with the church. The names of heretics and of excommunicated members were never inserted. Exclusion from these lists was a grave ecclesiastical penalty. The highest dignity, episcopal or imperial, would not avail to save the offender from its infliction. The highest dignity. So even if a pope became a heretic, it, yet indeed his name was removed from the diptychs. And you're going to learn about this historically. Now even though Benedict XIV was an apostate anti-pope, he teaches this truth here about how pope could become a heretic and then you have to remove his name from the diptychs. He taught this in his invalid encyclical Ex Quo in 1756. Wherefore, where commemorations are customarily made in the sacred liturgy, the Roman pontiff should be first commemorated, then one's own bishop or patriarch, provided they are Catholic. But if either or both of them are schismatics or heretics, they should by no means be commemorated, even a pope. If he's, he's admitting, too, that a pope could become a heretic, and if he is a heretic, he's removed from the diptychs. Removed because he no longer holds the office. If he's a material heretic, you've got to presume he doesn't hold the office. Treat him as a formal heretic till he proves his innocence due to inculpable ignorance of yours as heresy. So the minute you know somebody holds a heresy, and he's a heretic, you got to remove him from the diptychs. This is what they've done through the history of the church. We'll give a few examples here. For example, in the 5th century, Pope Anastasius II became a formal heretic and schismatic when he entered into religious communion with the Monophysite heretics and the Acacian schismatics, and as a result, his name, all the Orthodox Catholics removed his name, even though he's a pope from the diptychs, indicating too that he no longer had the office. We read from the Liber Pontificalis, on Anastasius II. Anastasius, by nationality a Roman, son of Peter from the 5th district, Toma, and Caput Torah, occupied this sea one year, 11 months, and 24 days. He set up the confession of Blessed Lawrence, the martyr, of silver weighing 80 pounds. At that time, many of the clergy and of the priests withdrew themselves from communion with him, the Pope, right? Because of that, and now without consulting the priests or bishops or the clergy of all the Catholic Church, he had communicated with the deacon of Thessalonica, Photinus by name, who was of the party of Acacius, the Acacian schismatics, and because he desired secretly to reinstate Acacius and could not. He was 
struck dead by divine will. And he was struck dead by divine will. And people all took that seat. And the Ecclesian Schismatics were condemned by the two previous popes. And he's entering into religious communion with them. Here's an example. People said, you're no pope. You're out of the detect. I'm not praying for you as the pope because you're no pope. And God killed uh, Anastasius II right after that. The heretic anti-pope Vigilius' name was removed from the diptychs by, rightly so, by the Emperor Justinian. And we're going to read about that later on. I'm not going to get into the details with that here. Uh, the heretic Bishop Theodore of Mopsuestia's name was removed from the diptychs as soon as he uh, manifested his heresies. And Mopsuestia, he was the Bishop of Mopsuestia, they removed him from the diptychs. We'll get into that later when we talk about the history on Vigilius in the three chapters. Now, when they removed these uh, heretics, a lot of them were removed from the diptychs before there was any trial or declaratory sentence. You don't need to have one. All you need to know is that, hey, this guy's a heretic, I'm removing him. It, it should also go to trial. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a trial. You should also have a trial. But we're going to read about this from the excommunication, its nature and historical developments and effects by the apostate Reverend Francis Edward Highland, 1928. The faithful have at times separated themselves from the communion of their pastors and bishops, from the communion of their primates because of deviations in faith or discipline, even laymen. It's, it's not, it's your obligation to do so. An example we give of that, we already about it with Nestorius, Pope St. Celestine already said it, that the minute Nestorius got up and manifested his heresy, he no longer had any power authority, he lost the office, he's cut off. And we have proof of that because he preached his heresy in church, and I'll give, I'm going to read this in a minute, uh, the first time he made it manifest that Mary's not the mother of God, and Eusebius a layman, it's not the heretic Eusebius, this is a different Eusebius, he's a saint and a martyr, he also became a Roman priest and then a bishop, he was present, and he got up and denounced Nestorius, but the people that were Orthodox were present, they left the church, removed him from the diptychs, diptychs who were not being religious communion with them, right away, they just, that was their instinct, you're a heretic, I'm out of here, you're not my bishop. We're going to read about it from the liturgical year by the apostate Abbot Guranjay. And this, he, th these books were published in 1927. And this is from uh, the second uh, month of the ninth day on the St. Cyril of Alexandria. It was then that Satan produced Nestorius, crowned with a fictitious hallow of sanctity and knowledge. This man, who was to give the clearest expression to the hatred of the serpent for the woman, was enthroned in the chair of Constantinople amid the applause of the whole East. He was the Bishop of Constantinople, which is like a patriarch. The joy of the good was of short duration. In the very year of his exaltation on Christmas Day, 428, the story is taken advantage of the immense concourse which had assembled in honor of the Virgin Mother and her child, pronounced from the Episcopal pulpit the blasphemous words, quote, Mary did not bring forth God. Her son was only a man. The instrument of the divinity, end quote. Well, see, I talk to anybody who knows the basic tone was, I'm out of here. You're done. If you love God and you love his faith, it's instant. It's a natural reaction. It's Catholic common sense. Well, you see what happens here. The multitude shuddered with horror. Today they would sit there and go, Duh, who cares? <laughs> go to Mass, receive communion, who cares? Can't judge him, he's the Pope. Can't judge him, he's the Bishop. Can't judge him, he's the priest. The multitude shudder with horror. Eusebius, a simple layman, rose to give expression to the general indignation and protested against the impiety. Soon a more explicit protest was drawn up and disseminating the name of the members of the grief-stricken church, launching an anthem against anyone who would dare to say, quote, the only begotten son of the Father and the, and the son of Mary are different persons, end quote. This generous attitude was the safeguard of Byzantium and won the praise of popes and councils. They praised Eusebius for this. It was his duty. If he didn't do it, Eusebius would have been guilty. It's a win or a lose. You either win or lose. There's no neutral. There's no lukewarm. You're hot or you're cold. If he wouldn't have done anything, he would have been guilty if he just sat there, even if he didn't believe it. That's the reaction of any Catholic should be. And if you don't react like that, guess what? You're not Catholic. And it should be instantaneous. You shouldn't have to say, now, if you messed up, I'm all over because you're a little bit of a coward and go home. You better correct it within a day or two and correct it real quick. And get out and do what you're supposed to by denouncing the pastor, avoiding him in religious matters, and removing him from the diptychs, and don't pray for him in the mass. You're not in religious communion with a bum like that. He says, when the shepherd becomes a wolf, the first duty of the flock is to defend itself. 
In the treasure of Revelation, there are essential doctrines which all Christians, by the very fact of their title, as such, are bound to know and defend. The principle is the same, whether it be a question of belief or conduct, dogma or morals, in the face of treachery like that of Nestorius, it may happen that many pastors keep silence for one reason or another in circumstances when religion itself is at stake. Sins of omission, the pastors aren't saying anything, the, the people that are supposed to censure the bishop aren't saying, maybe the pope's not even saying anything, or the so-called pope, but it doesn't matter. The chill children of the Holy Church at such times are those who walk by the light of their baptism, not the cowardly souls who under the specious pretext of submission to the powers that be, delay their opposition to the enemy in the hope of receiving instructions which are neither necessary nor desirable. Well, we'll wait for the his his superior to do. We'll wait for the Pope to settle it. In the meantime, I'll keep going to the Mass with this bastard, and let it, knowing that he's a heretic, knowing that he believes this, and receiving Holy Communion from his hands. I'm going to remain in communion until we get a declaration or an announcement. You're a heretic. You're already done. You're guilty by sins of omission if you didn't denounce them, but if you denounced them and you still remained in religious communion, you're still a heretic. He, he was knowingly in religious communion with a heretic is a heretic. Period. And this is the way you should react, you see? And this is before any declaration sentence. Pope St. Celestine said it. As soon as he preached it, he's gone. He's got no power and authority. Now, we're going to read also about Nestorius and the people that resisted him. And this is from the supplication to the emperor of the monks of Constantinople and if this, uh, from the 5th century. The source here is in Monsi. You can get, I got my sources. When you get the book, this book will be out shortly, by the way. It's not going to take real long. I got the book almost completed, too. But it has a lot more stuff that I have that I'm giving in this lecture. Now, I'm going to read this quote right here. Uh, Some of the most respected priests have often and openly in public assembly accused Nestorius, who occupies his Episcopal see, if, however, is licit to call him bishop. <coughs> see, they're even saying he should be degraded. He, shouldn't, he should not even be a bishop. To be degraded, we need a condemnatory sentence, but he's already lost the office. For the fact that he continues to, not, to deny with obstinate resolve that Christ by nature is true God and that the Holy Virgin is the mother of God. These same priests have cut off communion with him and to this day are still not in communion. Some have secretly remo removed themselves from his fellowship. Others from among the most sanctified of priests have been denied their faculties to preach for this reason, that in this holy diocese of Irene by the sea, they attacked the perverse doctrine which was again sprouting forth. It therefore happened that as the people were seeking the traditional preaching of the faith, they publicly cried out, An emperor we have, but no bishop. No bishop. Yet not only do you not have an office, you're not even a bishop. That's what the layman did in regards to Nestorius. And that's a first-hand source that witnessed it. Now, also in the history of your church, you've had people that after they were dead, they were condemned as heretics because the, the popes or the officials did not, did not have all the evidence. Maybe they weren't that famous in this area, but they were famous over here. So it's, it's a tradition. It goes back to the beginning of the church that even when somebody dies, if he escaped being condemned when he was alive as a heretic, they would then condemn him after he was dead. And they would say, we declare you to be excommunicated. Of course, that's a declaratory sentence. You can't excommunicate a man who's dead and is already in hell. What they're stating is that we declare him that when he was alive, as soon as he believed in that heresy, he was excommunicated and cut off the communion. And then they remove him from the uh, diptychs for the dead. So you can't, he's no longer among the faithful departed. This is a fact, historical proof, and even a dogma of the church, which some people try to fight over. We're going to get into that later on when we get into some examples. So they would then go back, if it was a bishop of a diocese, that after he died, they then condemned him as a heretic. They would then take his name out of the diptychs and say he was, no longer, he was not the bishop of his diocese. You know, so you're going to get caught one way or the other. Now, we have an example of the heretic Antipope Honorius' name was removed from the diptychs after he died. He held a monothletite heresy, and once it was established that he really did teach the heresy, which happened after he died, his name was removed from the diptychs. The heretic Antipope Honorius, who died in 638, is an example of an apparent pope who was condemned after his death in 681, at the Third Council of Constantinople, which is the Sixth Ecumenical Council, as an excommunicated heretic and whose name was thus removed from the diptychs. Thirty-two years after the end of this council, the heretical emperor Philippicus Bardanus ordered Honorius' name to be restored to the diptychs. He wanted to put back in. This proves it was removed. That's the main proof we're going to get to here. We're reading from a history of the councils of the church by apostate Bishop Joseph Heffoli. The new emperor 
Philippicus Bardanus persecuted orthodoxy in the Sixth Ecumenical Council. He had also, also ordered that the names of Sergius and Honorius and the others anathematized by the Sixth Ecumenical Council should be restored to the diptychs. They were removed. This is not an easy thing to get. They hide it from you today. So not only did, of course, if they, he was in a heretic, he had no office, he had no authority, he had no power. It's a dogma. They remo removed his, names from the, his name from the diptychs. Now we're going to get into the dogma and the historical fact that a pope can become an idolater or form a heretic and thus automatically lose his office. We're going to get into that here. We're going to give you some historical examples. Believe it or not, there's some people that still persist down to today to say that the pope can never teach an error, a heresy, or anything. They still believe that in the face of all the evidence that they're looking at and the face of all the contradictory teachings from these popes and so-called popes that contradict one another. So how could they both be right if, they're, if they oppose one another? So how could they be error-free? How could they never be culpable or susceptible of falling into heresy? We're going to show you right here. We're going to show you right, uh, our first quote is going to be from Pope St. Hermisdis, and, and this is his Libellus Professionis Fidei again, and he talks about how he himself could even become a heretic, and he's the Pope. And this was in the year 517. We anathematize all heresies. But if I, the Pope, shall attempt in any way to deviate from my profession, I confess that I am a confederate in my opinion with those whom I have condemned. He's admitting that as a Pope. He could teach heresy and become a heretic. We read this about this in the papal coronation oath, the very oath that the Popes take. I read from the papal coronation oath. I vow to guard the holy canons and decrees of the popes, as likewise the divine ordinances of heaven, because I am conscious of thee, whose place I take through the grace of God, whose vicarship I possess with thy support, being subject to the severest accounting before thy divine tribunal over all that I confess. If I should undertake to act in anything of contrary sense, or should permit, that it will be executed, that will not be merciful to me on the dreadful day of divine judgment. Accordingly, without exclusion, we subject to the severest excommunication anyone, be it ourselves, the popes, or, or be it another, who would dare to undertake anything new in contradiction to the constituted and evangelic tradition and the purity of the orthodox faith in the Christian religion or would seek to change anything by the opposing efforts, or would concur with those who would undertake such blasphemous venture. We, even a pope ourselves, will be excommunicated. That's the papal coronation oath. They say it right in there. Several apostate canonists, theologians, and anti-popes believe the dogma that a pope can fall away from the faith by heresy or idolatry and automatically lose his office but they only held these dogmas as allowable opinions, and thus not as dogmas, and hence were heretics on this point alone. And the ones who teach a pope cannot fall into heresy are not only heretics, but also liars, because several nominal popes have fallen into heresy, such as Liberius, Honorius, and Vigilius, and Anastasius II, as well as all the nominal popes since Innocent II down until today who are apostate anti-popes. These can, the canons and theologians and antipopes mentioned in the following quote are, were not only former heretics, but also idolaters for glorifying philosophy or mythology because they were scholastics and thus were also humanists. Nevertheless, their teachings that a pope can fall away from the faith by heresy or idolatry and automatically lose his office are true, which indicts them all the more and the nominal office holders in the days they lived. So what you're stating here is true. And, and nevertheless, they're, they're giving us a true testimony here. This is from the Protector of Faith by the Apostate Thomas Isabicki. 1981 is when he published this book. Canon law included several references to popes who had fallen into heresy. In terms borrowed from the canonist Huguccio, Olivi argued that any pope who contradicted an infallible, irreformable decree of a predecessor fell from his see because of his errors. Torquemada, adopting the doctrine of Aguccio, thought that the Pope could automatically lose his see through doctrinal deviation. Guided by traditional ideas on papal heresy or by his own experience of the schism, the Dominican anti-cardinal, I put that in there, Tor Torquemada, did not leave the matter entirely in God's hands. 
If the Pope attempted to teach false doctrine, Torquemada's argument was drawn from Aguccio rather than Torini, the pontiff would fall from the sea ipso facto. Quote, if the Roman pontiff becomes a heretic, he falls from Peter's chair and sea by the very fact of falling from Peter's faith. Consequently, a judgment rendered by such a heretic is not the judgment of the apostolic see, end quote. The recourse of Hoguccio's doctrine allowed him to separate the infallible see from the fallible person who might embrace false doctrine. And Torquemada even gave up his flirtation with Torini's ideas on papal infallibility, di di dismissing them as unacceptable. I think Torini said, God will never let the Pope fall into any error of heresy. He's one of those, he was the dope I was talking about, said the Pope can never teach error or even heresy. Torini was, in spite of the historical fact that many popes have done so, they can even teach, by the way, errors, folks, and, or allowable opinions that have been defined in their day and later on be proved to be wrong and weren't heretics. So they can teach error and they can teach heresy. Now, here's we, we read again here, and Torquemada even gave up his flirtation with Torini's ideas on papal infallibility, dismissing them as unacceptable. Quote, some say that God would not permit the Pope to fall into heresy or anything contrary to the faith, but would prevent him by death by resistance of other believers, by the instruction of others, by internal inspiration, or by other means. But we give another explanation, namely that if the Roman pontiff should fall into a condemned heresy, by that very fact he falls from the Peter's faith, he falls from the chair, uh, uh, Peter's chair in C. End quote. That was Torquemada. Now we go, the, the Pope was not exempt from divine law and natural law. A heretic Pope, as jo Johannes Teutonicus had noted, fell under any condemnation of false doctrine issued by previous popes. Of course, they're dogmas. We're all bind to it. You know, dogmas never change their meaning. They're eternal. The popes are bound to them like anyone else. Now, we're going to read where apostate anti-pope Innocent III, even though he's an apostate, tells the truth that a pope could fall into heresy. He teaches this in his sermon for in 1198. The Roman pontiff has no superior but God. Who, therefore, should a pope lose his savior, could cast him out of the temple, uh, or trample him underfoot? Since that a pope, it is said, gather the flock into thy fold. Truly, he should not flatter himself about his power, nor should he rashly glory in his honor and high estate, because the less he is judged by men, the more he can be judged by God. Still the less can the Roman pontiff glory, because he can be judged by men, or rather can be shown to be already judged. If, for example, he should wither away into heresy, Pope can teach heresy. Of course, many have in the past. They know that because he's one. He's a heretic himself. Because he who does not believe is already judged. In such a case, it should be said of him, if salt should lose its savor, it is good for nothing but to be cast out and trampled underfoot by men. End quote. We also read from the apostate Antoninus in the Summa Theologica in 1459. In the case of the Pope becoming a heretic, he would find himself by that fact alone and without any other sentence separated from the church. A pope who would be separated from the church by heresy, therefore, will by that very fact itself cease to be the head of the church. He could not be a heretic and remain pope because since he is outside the church, he cannot possess the keys of the church. All right, we're now going to give you the evidence of some popes and nominal popes who became idolaters and formal heretics. We start out by quoting from apostate anti-pope Hadrian VI, who was the anti-pope from 1522 to 1523. This is a truthful quote that he states here. That's why I'm quoting him in this particular instance. He happened to be right on this. And he happened to be one of the people he was talking about also. right? He goes, if by the Roman church you mean its head or pontiff, it is beyond question that he can err, even in matters touching the faith. He does this when he teaches heresy by his own judgment or decretal. In truth, many Roman pontiffs were heretics. The last of them was Pope John XXII. Not actually accurate what he said. They're not really Roman pontiffs. They're anti-popes. You know, so he's not right about that. But he's actually making a truthful statement. That, and you've looked at the history of the church. Many of them taught heresies. We're also reading from the protector of the faith by the apostate Thomas Zabicki. The classic cases of papal heresy were those of Anastasius II and Marcellinus, both mentioned in the Decretum and of Pope Honorius I, cited in the Pelagia. All right, the first pope we're going to list here that fell into idolatry, and he was a true pope, he fell into idolatry, and then he repented and died as a saint and a martyr, which, which goes to show you, no matter how bad these apostate anti-popes or bishops are, they're still alive, they could convert, they could repent. Aaron even worshipped up and fell away from God for a while. Aaron, the high priest, and he came back to God. So 
let this be an example to all the apostates that may be listening to my lecture, you know, that, you know, if you have any kind of conscience about what you're doing, you know, you can abjure, come into the church, confess your sins, and God will forgive you. But you first have to have remorse, and you have to condemn what's going on. You have to already know something's wrong. But God, don't despair and think that you can't repent and convert because your sins are so bad, because your sins are as bad as any as can ever be. They're the worst sins you can ever commit with these apostate clerics have been doing. But they could repent. Here's an example of Pope St. Marcellus, Marcellinus, who reigned from 296 to 304, and he, offered, he gave in because they threatened his life, and he offered up a few grains of incense to an idol. And because of that, he lost his office, and he had to be reelected. But you're gonna, you're gonna, we're going to read a little bit about that here from the Liber Pontificalis on Marcellinus. Uh, he was the bishop in the time of Diocletian and Maximian from July 1st in the 6th consulship of Diocletian and the 2nd of Constantius until the year when Diocletian was consul in the ninth time and Maximian for the 8th. At that time was a great persecution, so that within 30 days, 17,000 Christians of both sexes and diverse provinces were crowned with martyrdom. For this reason, Marcellinus himself was hailed to sacrifice, that he might offer incense, and he did it. And after a few days, inspired by penitence, he was beheaded by the same Diocletian and crowned with martyrdom for the faith of Christ. There's a footnote in there. This is not from the Liber, but it's a footnote in the Liber. A single manuscript, manuscript contains the following more detailed account. Quote, And after a few days the Synod was held in the province of Campania in the city of Cecina, which was his own, which with his own lips he professed his penitence in the presence of 180 bishops. He was at trial too. There's another issue here. They actually brought him to trial. He wore a garment of hair cloth and ashes upon his head and repented, saying that he had sinned. Then Diocletian was wroth and seized him and bade him sacrifice to images. But he cried out with tears, saying, quote, It repenteth me sorely for my former ignorance. And he began to utter blasphemy against Diocletian and the images of demons made with hands, so inspired by penance he was beheaded. So he ended up dying as a martyr. You can read my book on the rest of these details, but uh, I'm just going to summarize it here so I don't give you a, a lengthy quote. But what happened was, uh, the people knew he was a, a doctor also, and then he said that um, I'm not worthy of being the Pope, I'm going to depose myself. For the, the story says he was brought to trial, but the people don't want you to believe Popes can be brought to trial until they believe it wasn't a real trial, that he approved of it, so it was being run by him, you know. But first of all, during that trial, and from what he's saying is, I'm not worthy to be Pope, I depose myself, so then he had to be reelected. But even by Catholic common sense, he knew he wasn't worthy of the papacy. The reality was, he automatically lost the office. He didn't need to depose himself. But here's an example of a pope who fell into idolatry. That's it. So you say a pope can't err, a pope can't. There's Pope St. Marcellinus, and the guy that repented of it. We're now going to get into another famous ca uh, case. Pope Liberius also was the pope, and then he fell into heresy. Uh, this is historical fact. Some people try to deny it. I'm only going to give you a summary of the events of what happened regarding him. In 353, Liberius is elected to the papacy and did not hold the Arian heresy. 355, Pope Liberius defends the faith, opposes the Arian emperor Constantius, refuses to excommunicate St. Athanasius, and was sent into exile. So good, so far, so good. 357, after two years in exile, Liberius fell away from the faith and became an Arian and excommunicates St. Athanasius. 357. After Liberius became a former heretic and thus automatically lost his office, Felix II, a Catholic, is elected to the papacy. 358. The Arian antipope Liberius returns to Rome by order of the Arian heretic Constantius. He now freed him. Constantius deposes the Catholic Pope Felix II. Liberius assumes the role of the Pope and both begin a persecution against Christians. 358, Pope St. Felix II is beheaded and dies as a martyr. He reigned as Pope for one year, three months, and two days. Damasus, who would be the next Pope, buries his body reverently. 366, Liberius died in 366. Some say Liberius remained in Arian until his death. Others say he repented and abjured, and thus became Catholic. Even if he did abjure and become Catholic, that would not make him the Pope, as he would have have to have been re-elected to the papacy. 366, the next pope, Damasus I, condemns Liberius 
as a heretical antipope and declares his acts when he was an antipope as null and void. You'll read this in my book in detail. I'm only giving you a summary. Now, in the 14th century, when apostate antipope Gregory XIII was revised in the Roman Martyrology, there was an investigation over Felix II as to whether he was a pope and martyr or not. If not, his name was to be removed from the martyrology. Theologians held opposing opinions. During the investigation, a miracle occurs in which Felix II's body is discovered in the church of Cosmos and Damien, and on the tomb is inscribed, quote, the body of St. Felix, Pope and Martyr, who condemned Constantius, end quote. Those who opposed Felix II conceded, and Felix II continues to be listed Pope and Martyr in the Roman Martyrology down to today. This proves Liberius was a heretic, and he took his place, or he would never be listed as a Pope. That was what the big argument was. People were trying to depend, defend Liberius and say he never fell. Felix wasn't really the Pope. It was invalid election and all that. Here's a miracle confirming Felix II. So if he's the Pope when Liberius is alive, and Liberius lived even after Felix II lived, then Liberius was a heretic, and he wasn't a Pope, and he lost his office. Open up your list of Popes and read it, and you're going to see Felix II reigning as a Pope by Liber Liberius is alive. You, I get into very much detail in the book on this, but that's the summary of that. Liberius indeed was a heretic, and he lost his office. Regardless of what people try to tell you. Some people try to tell you he never fell into heresy even. But even St. Thanasius himself mentions that he did fall away. You'll read that in my book. We're not going to talk about Pope Anastasius II, who became an anti-pope when he uh, entered into religious communion with the Acacian Schismatics and Monophysite heretics. Pope St. Felix III condemned the Bishop of Constantinople, Acacius, as a schismatic and had his name removed from the diptychs. Two popes later, Pope Anastasius II became a former heretic and a formal schismatic for entering into religious communion with the Acacian schismatics and the Monophysite heretics. The Acacian schismatics sympathized with the Monophysites and they uh, refused to accept the infallibility of the Council of Chalcedon. Hence, the Acacian schismatics were also heretics. And so, any, uh, so uh, Pope Anastasius II became a former, her former heretic and formal schismatic for entering into religious communion with the Acacian schismatics and the Monophysite heretics and thus automatically lost his office and hence was no longer the Pope. All Catholics then removed his names from the diptychs and the TG Tor prayer of the Mass and separated from him in. We're reading from the Foundations of the Conciliar Theory by the apostate Brian Tyranny and he published this book in 1955. Text in the Decretum implied quite clearly that a Pope could be guilty of heresy and which even cited specific examples of Popes who have erred in matters of faith. Pope Marcellinus was said to have committed idolatry. The case that was most frequently quoted by the Decretist discussions was that of Pope Anastasius II. Repeatedly, when the question of the indefectibility of the Roman Church arose, the Decretist cited the case of Anastasius to prove that whatever the relevant text might mean, they could not mean that the Pope personally was divinely preserved from error. Anastasius had been deserted by the Church and smitten by God, precisely because he had erred. The Pope's offense was that he entered into communion with Photinus, knowing him to be guilty, and so condoned his heresy. Now, I mentioned before how God struck him dead right after that. They removed him from the diptychs and removed themselves from religious communion with him. Okay, we're now going to talk about Vigilius, who was the anti-Pope from 537 to 555. I say anti-Pope because he was never the Pope because he was elected by simony and because he was elected in place of the unjustly deposed Pope St. Silvarius. Hence, Pope St. Silvarius was the true Pope, and Vigilius was a simonical and schismatic anti-Pope. Pope St. Silvarius died shortly after Vigilius was elected. Hence, to be the true Pope, Vigilius would have had to have been re-elected to the papacy and abjure from his heresy of simony, neither of which he did. Hence, Vigilius was never the Pope for, the, for these two reasons I just gave you. Nevertheless, he goes down in history as a Pope by many people, but he was not the true Pope. We're going to read from the nominal Catholic Encyclopedia on Vigilius. Vigilius is said to have agreed to the plans of the intriguing Empress who promised from the Papal See and a large sum of money, 700 pounds of gold. Meanwhile, Severius had been made Pope through the influence of the King of the Goths. Soon after the Byzantine uh, commander Belisarius garrisoned the city of Rome, which was however besieged again by the Goths, Vigilius gave Belisarius the letters 
from the court of Constantinople, which recommended Vigilius himself for the papal see. False accusations now led Belisarius to depose Silverius. Owing to the pressure exerted by the Byzantine commander, Vigilius was elected pope in place of Silverius and consecrated and enthroned on the 29th of March, 537. Vigilius brought it about that the unjustly deposed Silverius was put into his keeping where the late pope soon died from the harsh treatment he received. After the death of this predecessor, Vigilius was recognized as the pope by all the Roman clergy. Now, once Silverius died, everyone agrees Silverius was the pope, he was unjustly deposed. Therefore, when Vigilius was elected, Silverius was still alive, that election is null and void. He cannot just become pope by the mere fact that Silverius died. He would have had it been re-elected, and he would have had George Simon's simony, neither of which he did. Nevertheless, most, a lot of people do believe he was the Pope, and he was put to the Pope, but the people didn't know he was not the Pope. Okay? Even if Vigilius had been the Pope, which he was not, he would have automatically lost his office in 553 for defending the heretical three chapters and for not condemning uh, Theodore of Mopsuestia as a heretic. The three chapters are the heretical writings of Theodore of Mopsuestia, the heretical writings of Theodore of Cyrus, and a heretical letter attributed to Bishop Ibis of Edessa to the Nestorian Persian Bishop Maurus. These works contain the heresy that Jesus Christ was only a man and thus not also God, the Arian heresy. The same heresy that Arius and Nestorius held. Theodore of Mopsuestia held it before Nestorius. But not only was the three chapters condemned, but also Theodore of Mopsuestia was condemned as a heretic because he never abjured his heresy. Theodore of Cyrus and Ibas abjured their heresy at the Council of Chalcedon, and thus they were not to be condemned as heretics, but only their heretical writings were to be condemned. So it's important to understand what the three chapters were and, and what was going on with Theodore of Mopsuestia in relation to uh, Vigilius. Now, in 547, the Emperor Justinian's imperial edict condemns the three chapters, and he condemns Theodore of Mopsuista as a heretic. Correctly so. In 547, Vigilius privately condemns the three chapters and Theodore of Mopsuistia. That's good. That's fine. In 548, Vigilius, in his Eudicatum, publicly condemns the three chapters and Theodore of Mopsuistia. Again, very good. So he's holding on to the correct position right here, Vigilius. In 550, Vigilius excommunicates Roman clerics who oppose his Eudicatum. It's even better, because he's saying if you don't condemn the three chapters and you don't condemn Theodore of Mopsuist as a heretic, you're ex automatically excommunicated. All good and correct. In 550, Vigilius and Justinian call for a council to resolve conflicts and re-condemn the three chapters and Theodore of Mopsuistia. And in one grand a universal synod. In 551, Justinian's second imperial edict resolves the conflicts and recondemns the three chapters in Theodore of Mopsuestia. He wasn't waiting for a council because other people were still trying to defend the three chapters and defend Theodore of Mopsuestia, so he resolved the conflicts and he condemned them before the council. Now, this got Vigilius angry because he was supposed to wait for the council. So in 551, Vigilius, in his Damnatio, ex excommunicates anyone who consents to Justinian's second edict. He didn't say the edict was wrong, or he was wrong for condemning three chapters, or he was wrong for condemning Theodore, Theodore Mopsuistia. He was saying, you were wrong for not waiting for me to resolve the conflicts together in a general synod. So, the, uh, in 552, Vigilius unexcommunicates those who promised to wait for a council to resolve the conflict. So what happened was Justinian and all those people that were supporting his second imperial edict said, okay, we'll wait for a second council. Please lift the excommunication. You are the Pope, the head of the church, at least they believed he was a Pope. He was a putative Pope to them. We'll wait for the council. So he lifted the excommunication and now they're waiting for this council to resolve and to recondemn the conflicts and to recondemn the three chapters and Theodore. So what happens in 553, Vigilius gives and then recalls his assent to hold a council, and Justinian opens it instead, and that's the Second Council of Constantinople. So, the council's called, then Vigilius backs out. Then Justinian says, what are you backing out for? 
We waited for the council. Here's the council. We got a giant conflict. People are are defending this uh, the her heretical three chapters. They're defending Theodore. I'm calling the council now because the Pope refused to do it. He then now he's backing out on his promise. Now during the council when it was being held, Vigilius is petitioned several times to attend the council, but he refuses. After each session, they're sending him what's going on in the council and saying, "Please." We want you to come to the session. We want you to get in there and come to these sessions. They sent all kinds of people to him, petitioning him, begging him to come to the council. And he kept refusing, obstinately refusing. And then he said, I don't, I'm not even going to go to the council. I'm going to write up my own, my own letter, edict on my own, without the council, and I'm going to give my own decision. So now he's backing out of the whole idea of the council. So, what does he do though? Uh, uh, he writes up his own uh, edict. Uh, this is the, the edict that Vigilius writes. It's on 515, 553, after the fourth session, and before the fifth session of this council, Vigilius promulgates his letter titled the Constitutum, in which he opposes the second council of Constantinople, and for the first time he defends the three chapters, and Theodore of Mopsuestia, and thus fell into heresy and lost his office. Now he's saying, the three chapters are okay. They're orthodox, and Theodore's orthodox, and he takes back what he taught in his Eudicatum. Now you got a so-called pope opposing what he taught under the Eudicatum, right? Which was in 548, right? And now in his Constitutum in 553, he's defending the heretical three chapters and Theodore of Mopsuestia. Now I didn't give you, I didn't read what the three chapters are under the heretical teachings. You have to, you can read it in my book. I go into much more detail on all these things to see how horrible it is, how heretical it is, how abominable it is. For this guy to defend it, you're out, pal. You're out. So right after that happened, right? As soon as Justinian gets a hold of the Constitutum and finds out about it, he, he removes uh, uh, Vigilius from the diptychs, deposes him, and he starts looking for another pope. Because he says, you can't be the pope. He says, you know, you, you privately uh, condemned it, the, these things, you pri publicly condemned them, now you're, you're publicly uh, supporting them? And I'm going to go to the reading on this right here, of, of when, uh, uh, the, the reading of Vigilius, when he wrote his Constitutum. And this is from a history of the councils of the church by the apostate bishop Joseph Heffaly. In the Constitutum, the Pope said he did not venture to pronounce an anthema on the person of the departed Theodore of Mopsuestia, and did not allow the others that they should do so, so he didn't want it to be condemned. His big excuse was because he was already dead. But if you read, the, the Justinian already proved that the churches condemned many people after they were dead. So it, it's a practice in the church and a dogma that uh, you can definitely condemn heretics even after they're dead. We went over that earlier in this lecture. That was one of his excuses. In the second place, as regarded the writings circulated under the name of Theodoret, he wondered that anything was undertaken to the dishonor of this man. The Pope says he had instituted inquiries with respect to the letter of the Venerable Ibos and declared that the letter of Ibos must remain inviolate. So he's, saying, he's now defending the, the, these heretical three chapters. He's defending them. The Constitutum finally, Constitutum finally closes with these words. Quote, and if he was a pope, this would be infallible. A pope has the infallible ability to define on matters of faith and morals and to excommunicate people for heresy or other sins. But here's what Vigilius is saying at the end of the Constitutum. We ordain and decree that it be permitted to no one who stands in ecclesiastical order or office to write or bring forward or undertake or teach anything contradictory to the contents of this Constitutum in regard to the three chapters or after this declaration, begin a new controversy about them. And if anything has already been done or spoken in regard to the three chapters in contradiction of this our ordinance, by any one whatsoever, this we declare void and, uh, void by the authority of the apostolic city. So he's saying you have to now defend the three chapters and defend Theodore of Mopsuista. You cannot condemn them by the power of the apostolic see. All right? But in 548, this same so-called pope came out and condemned the three chapters. Now he's got, you got two papal teachings here, so-called papal teachings contradicting one another. Now, we're going to read where Justinian deposed him and removed his name from the diptychs and started to look for another pope. 
This first we're going to read in the Second Council of Constantinople where it says that anybody who goes against or defends the three chapters, it says in here, you can read the whole quote, uh, it says that they shall be stripped of their office of bishop or cleric, but if, if they defend the three chapters, so that, that's the penalty of automatic excommunication and loss of office for defending any heresy. Now we're going to read about Justinian's uh, deposition of uh, Vigilius. And this is from a history of the councils of the church by the apostate bishop Joseph Ephely. The papal subdeacon Servos Dei was now standing at the door of the emperor in order to convey this document, Vigilius' constitutum, to him. The emperor, however, did not admit the subdeacon, but sent him by his minister the following answer to Vigilius, quote, I had invited you to take measures in common with the other patriarchs and bishops with respect to the three chapters. You have refused this, and now wish for yourself alone to give a judgment and writing in the Constitutum. Now, he could give a judgment alone if he was the Pope. That wasn't really the biggest issue, but he went against his own promise that he would do this in the council. So that's the worst part is that his Constitutum actually defended the three chapters. He says, but if you have in this condemned the three chapters, the Constitutum, I have no need of this new document, for I have from you many others of the same content. If, however, you have in this new document departed from your earlier declarations, you have condemned yourself. Absolutely true. Now, it goes on to say from Hefley here, the Synod declared that from this, the zeal of the emperor for the true faith was clearly to be recognized and promised daily to pray for him. As, however, they wanted to close the session, the Quastor Constantine presented one other letter of the emperor, containing the command that the name of Vigilius should be struck from the diptychs because through his defense of the three chapters, he had participated in the piety of Nestorius and Theodore. You just got to read those things to see how bad they are. And it's, no, it's a formal heretic too because he knew about them. That the emperor had demanded, even during the fifth synod, that the name of Vigilius should be struck from the diptychs we have already seen. And we found it probable that the edict in reference to this was published generally on July 14, 553. About the same time occurred what Anastasius and the author of the additions to the Chronicle of Marcel Luna relate, that Vigilius and his clergy were banished into different places, that they had been condemned to labor in the mines, the liberation, however, was dependent upon the condition that Vigilius would recognize the Fifth Synod, the Second Council of Constantinople. So he locked them up and banished them, rightly so, and said, until you accept the Synod and abjure from your heresies, you're, you're going to stay banished. When Vigilius declared himself for the three chapters, Justinian intended to raise Pelagius I to the Roman See in place of Vigilius. The Pope's compliance, however, altered the case. Now we're going to listen. Now we're going to read the next part. The Pope's compliance, so-called Pope, putative Pope. Vigilius then abjured his heresy. He turned back around and then condemned the three chapters, and he condemned Theodore of Mopsuisti when he was in banishment. He came to his senses on this issue, either out of sincerity or because he didn't want to be banished. Now he goes back to his original position that he heard in the Uticatum. He passes two edicts where he now supports the Second Council of Constantinople, and confirms it. If he was a true Pope, it would have been confirmed, but he wasn't. And then writes two edicts condemning the three chapters and, and condemning Theodore of Mopsuistia. So he abjured his heresy. We're going to read about that right here in a History of the Councils. And this, this took place, by the way, seven, about seven months after, uh, the end of the council. About seven months later is when he abjured and he repented. Okay. We're going to read this on the History of the Councils of the Church by the apostate bishop Joseph Hefeli. The liberation of Vigilius, however, was dependent upon the condition that Vigilius would recognize the Fifth Synod, and he did so. In two edicts, the Pope expressed this assent. We see from this that more than seven months had passed since the end of the Synod, when Vigilius arrived at his new resolve. Here he says, now he's paraphrasing what he says. I don't have the exact words, but it's paraphrased. The enemy of the human race who sows discord everywhere had separated him from his colleagues. The bishops assembled in Constantinople, but Christ had removed the darkness again from his spirit and had again united the church and the whole world. There was no shame in confessing and recalling a previous error. The whole church must now know that he rightly ordained the following. 
we condemn and anathematize together with all the heresies who have been already condemned and anathematized at the four holy synods and by the Catholic Church, also Theodore, formerly Bishop of Mopsuistia, now he's condemning Theodore, correctly so, and his impious writings. Also that which Theodore wrote and piously wrote against the right faith, against the twelve anathematas of Cyril, against the synod of Ephesus and the defense of Theodore and Nestorius. Moreover, we anathematize and condemn the impious letter attributed to Ibas. He's now condemning the three chapters, rightly so. Now he ends this edict by saying, finally, we subject to the same anathema all, be all who believe the three chapters referred to could at any time be approved or defended, or who venture to oppose the present anathema. Those, on the contrary, who have condemned or do condemn the three chapters, we hold for brethren and fellow priests. Whatever we ourselves or others have done in defense of the three chapters, we declare invalid. No kidding. Not only invalid, heretical, and if you were the Pope, you would have lost it then. And you can't get it back just by an abjuration. you got to get re-elected, and he was never re-elected, which is another big problem. And that's beside the fact he was never the Pope in the first place. The second edict he wrote, and when he correctly condemned the three chapters in Theodore, was dated on February 23rd, 554, and it was titled... Uh, uh, it's, it's referred to as a second constitutum. And in that, he just restates what I just stated to you by condemning the heretical three chapters and condemning Theodore of Mopsuestia. So here, here we have an example, right, of a pope that in his judicatum, he was correct, and his constitutum, the first constitutum, he was a heretic, uh, who opposed it, and then his second constitutum, he's correct again, and recondemns the three chapters. So if this guy was a pope, and every one of his teachings was a papal teaching, they oppose one another. So not all the teachings of a pope are error-free, or free from all heresy. But he wasn't a pope anyway, as we just said. Now, and he couldn't have been the pope simply by abjuring. Once he lost his office, when he defended the heretical three chapters, he cannot just get his office back by abjuring. All right? And he never abjured, and... We have history. He, he died. Vigilius died at Syracuse towards the end of the year 554, or in January 555. So he died shortly after he abjured. But the, but his abjuration would have not made him the pope. So if he was the pope, he would have lost it in 553. Even though he abjured in 554, he, never, he would have never regained the papacy. But not only would he had to abjure uh, from his heresy, he would also of, of defending the three chapters and Theodore. He would also also have had to abjure from his simony. Because as you remember in the beginning, I said he was elected by simony. And there's no record he ever confessed or abjured that his simony. But nevertheless, I do say one thing about him. I don't know if he did that or not. His abjuration was still commendable. I don't know why he did it, if it was sincere or not. But if it was sincere, okay. But if it wasn't sincere, then, he's, then it wasn't true in the eyes of God. But what, what I mean by commendable, it prevented further scandal and further schism and all the... Uh, heretical bishops that were uh, defending the three chapters, a lot of them then got in line and actually condemned the three chapters. So it, it ended what could have been a real big mess by him admitting that he was wrong. So you got a real big problem with this guy right here, you know, and, and the fact that he, if, if he was the Pope, all these teachings cannot be part of the Apostolic See. He was either wrong in his Eudicatum or wrong in his Eudicatum in his second constitutum or he was wrong in this First constitutum. And we know he was wrong in the first one because he taught heresy by defending the heretical three chapters. Now, you have another proof here. Vigilius proves one thing also, this case of Vigilius. He proves that a pope can be tried, sentenced, and punished. If he goes down as a true pope in the place of Pope St. Silverius, then they're saying Pope St. Silverius was justly deposed, and it was valid, deposing him. Now, and even though Vigilius was never the Pope, the Emperor Justinian and many others believed he was the Pope. And thus, for them, Vigilius was a putative of the Pope. Here, then, is an example of an inferior, the Emperor, judging, denouncing, and deposing a man he believed was the Pope. And for this, Justinian goes down in history as a hero and defender of the faith. Not only were Justinian's actions praised by the very so-called Pope he judged, denounced, and deposed, but they were praised by future Popes, especially those who reconfirmed the Second Council of Constantinople, which would have never succeeded if not for the Holy Roman Emperor Justinian. So you got a problem there. One way or another, the question never revolved around, even with Silverius and Vigilius, whether you could depose a pope, whether you could bring a pope to trial. They never questioned that. 
They all knew that could be done. The only question was, were, were you justly deposing Silverius or were you justly deposing Vigilius? Was it just or was it not? That was the only question. All right, the next pope we're going to talk about, who became a uh, heretical anti-pope, if that's if he wasn't always a heretical anti-pope, was Honorius, who reigned as the so-called pope from 625 to 638. He, heard, he held the heresy, the monothletite heresy, that Jesus Christ only has one will, the divine will. He believed Jesus Christ has two natures, a, 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 a divine nature and a human nature, but that he only had one will, the will of God. But if he has two natures, he has to have two wills, a divine will and a human will. So he was a monothletite heretic. Now, uh, he wrote this heresy in two of his letters that were private letters to this bishop that were made public, and they're kind of ambiguous. They can go both ways, and it's and and, and, and it's sort of like uh, there was a big argument whether whether they really did contain heresy or not. So it took a while before they can get around to condemning this guy. Those two letters were he wrote in 634, and one was titled Scripta Fraternitas Vestre, and the other was Scripta Scripta Delictissimi Filii, and they were both to Sergius, the Patriarch of Constantinople. And there was a whole big fight over those letters. People were saying, he's a heretic. I said, no, you're not reading it the right way. So even after he died, this dispute was going on. So 40 years after Honoris' death, the Catholic Church finally infallibly settled the dispute. And the Sixth Ecumenical Council, which was the Third Council of Constantinople, called by Pope St. Agatho, it was held from 680 to 681 and confirmed by Pope St. Leo II in 682. Infallibly condemned Honoris' two letters as heretical. Now that's a solemn definition. Infallible from a Pope saying, indeed, the, I, these letters are heretical. And he infallibly condemned Honorius as a monothletite heretic and declared him to be excommunicated. And they had his name removed from the diptychs also. I'm now going to read from the Third Council of Constantinople. After we had read the doctrinal letters of Sergius of Constantinople to Cyrus and Pharis and to Pope Honorius, as well as the letter, uh, the letter of the latter to Sergius, we find that these documents are quite foreign to the apostolic dogmas, also to the declarations of the holy councils, and all the fathers of repute, and follow the false teachings of the heretics. Therefore we entirely reject them, and execrate them as hurtful to the soul. But the names of these men must also be thrust forth from the church, namely that of Sergius, who first wrote on this impious doctrine, further that of Cyrus of Alexandria, of Pyrrhus, Paul, and Peter of Constantinople, and Theodore of Pharon, all of whom Pope Agatho rejected in his letter to the emperor. We anathematize them all, and along with them, in our unanimous decree, that there shall be expelled from the church and anathematized Honorius, formerly Pope of old Rome, because we found in his letter to Sergius that in all respects he followed his view and confirmed his impious doctrines. There it is. Honorius was infallibly condemned in an ecumenical council. His letters were condemned as heretical, he was, and he was excommunicated. Now, Honorius is already dead. As I mentioned in the early thing, you can't excommunicate a dead man. That's a declaratory sentence stating that from the instant that Honorius held this heresy, he was automatically excommunicated, which means he was no longer the Pope. That's proved also because uh, as I, they removed also Honorius' names from the diptychs, referring to him as a Pope. Now, not only did the Third Council of Constantinople condemn Honorius as a heretic, so did the Second Council of Nicaea, which was another ecumenical council, which was confirmed by Pope Hadrian in 787. Also condemned him. I'll just read the uh, first part here. Last part. We, we, we have also anathematized the idle tales of Origen, Didymus, and Avarigus, and the doctrine of the one will held by Sergius, Honorius, Cyrus, and Pyrrhus, or rather we anathematize their own evil will. Again, and another ecumenical council, the Fourth Council of Constantinople, which was confirmed by Pope Hadrian II, again condemned Honorius as an automatically excommunicated heretic. They always repeat the anathemas of the past councils, and Honorius is now being reanathematized in all these future ecumenical councils. I'll just read here. So we a little bit. So we anathematized 
Theodore, who was Bishop of Pharaon, Sergius, Pyrrhus, Paul, and Peter, the unholy prelates of the Church of Constantinople, and with these, Honorius of Rome, we anathematize him. Therefore, the highest authority of the Catholic Church, a pope teaching in three ecumenical councils, infallibly condemned Honorius as a heretic. So don't let anybody tell you a pope cannot become a heretic. He can't teach error. He can't teach heresy. This is infallible. If you don't accept this, then you're a heretic. There's an example of a pope who fell into heresy and lost his office because they removed him from the diptychs. I mentioned that earlier in the lecture. In my book, I have going to a few more examples of some other popes and anti-popes. I just gave you a few here. But all the so-called popes from Innocent II in 1130 forward were all apostate anti-popes. I have all that evidence in my Great Apostasy book and also in the Desecration of, Ca of, of Catholic Places book. And I also have an article titled, uh, No Pope Since 1130. You've got to read that article. Not only were these popes, they were apostates for supporting and glorifying philosophy and mythology, and, and supporting or allowing uh, places to be desecrated with images against the faith and morals. That was, that's one of the main reasons why they're apostates. But they also held several heresies of their own. Horrible heresies, which I go over in an article. I only pulled out a few of them. I'm not going to go into it here to take time on it now, but you can look at that article and you're going to see all the heresies that they held on top of it. All right, we're now going to talk about secret formal heretics cannot hold offices in the Catholic Church. Well, that should be obvious because all formal heretics are not Catholic. Whether you're a public formal heretic or a secret formal heretic, you're not Catholic. It doesn't matter whether you deny Jesus is God privately in your heart or speak it out publicly, you're a formal heretic and you're not Catholic. And as such, you cannot hold an office in the Catholic Church. Now, the Council of Ephesus is the first time, from my information that I have, that it was solemnly defined that non-Catholics cannot hold offices in the Catholic Church. But it was always part of the ordinary magisterium from Pentecost Day. In that same Council of Ephesus in 431, they also specifically mentioned that even private uh, heretics are deposed from their offices. This is in Canon 4. But if some of the clergy should rebel and dare to hold the opinions of Nestorius or Celsius, either in private or public, it has been judged by the Holy Synod that they too are deposed. So you're hearing it right there, solemn definition, that even if you're a secret formal heretic holding the heresy of Nestorius or anyone else, you're deposed. We read now from the Protector of the Faith by the apostate Thomas M. Isabicki. Torquemada insisted, without membership in the church through faith, it was impossible to hold the power of the keys and thus a heretic pope ceased to be the head of the church. Fallen from the rock of Peter's faith, he lost his tenure of office. This was true even in the case of secret heresy. And we're going to quote from a book titled The Foundations of the Conciliar Theory by the apostate Brian Tyranny. Johannes Teutonicus held that a pope could be deposed for any notorious crime and for heresy even if it were secret. And now we're going to read from a book titled Papal Immunity and Liability in the Writings of the Medieval Canonist by James Moynihan. The Commentum Arbatense states that the later Glossa Palatina and Gloss Ece Uci Leo explicitly affirmed that a pope could be accused of occult heresy as well. Occult means secret. As an argument that a pope could be judged even for occult heresy, Guido de Biasso cited, and they give the quote from the Grazians Decretum, which records, among other things, the words of the bishops who had been summoned in a synod to judge Pope Symmachus. Now, the, uh, one, the first heresy in the church is, is, this, as, is known as simony, okay? It was by Simon Magus when he tried to buy uh, the bishopric. He wanted, and he tried to buy the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why it's named after him as simony. And simony is a heresy. That's, it's, not, it's not a sin of immorality. It's, it's actually a heresy. It's when you try to buy or sell holy things, spiritual things that give grace, sacraments, sacramentals, offices, if you try to buy or sell those, that's the, the heresy of simony. And right from the very beginning of the church, when Simon Peter, uh, we're going to quote it right now, this is part of the ordinary magisterium from Pentecost Day, and solemn magisterium also uh, has defined that anybody who's guilty of the heresy of simony 
cannot hold an office because they're not Catholic. They can't hold an office as the main thing. They also taught that they're worthy of being degraded. So that if you're a bishop, you, you, they should even degrade you from the rank of bishop. And a priest, they should laicize you. We're going to read about, about this in the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 18 to 21. And when Simon saw that by the imposition of the hands of the apostles, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also the power that on whomsoever I shall lay my hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Keep thy money to thyself to perish with thee because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast no part nor lot with us in this matter, for thy heart is not right with God, end quote. And the Catholic Church is always interpreted to mean you have no part, you cannot be a bishop, you cannot buy an office. If you try to do it, you don't get the office. If you try to buy the papal office and you're elected by all the cardinals, you don't get the office. We read a Catholic commentary on that. Simony, this wicked sorcerer, Simon is noted by St. Irenaeus and others to have been the first heretic and father of all heretics to come into the church of God. And he, he gave the onset to purchase with his money spiritual functions, that is, to buy the office of bishop. For to have power to give the Holy Spirit by the imposition of hands is to be a bishop, and to buy the priesthood. For to have the power to remit sins and to consecrate Christ's body is to be a priest. He attempted to buy the authority to minister sacraments, to preach, to have cure of souls, to buy a benefice, and likewise in all other spiritual things, whereof either to make sale or purchase for money, or money's worth, which is a great horrible sin called simony, and is named simonical heresy, of this detestable man who was first attempted to buy the spiritual functions of the office. We're going to now quote from Pope St. Gregory the Great in his book 11, letter 46. Restrain the error of simonical heresy, and the church is subject to you. For not to speak of other things, what sort of men can they be when in sacred orders who are advanced to them, not by merit, but by bribes? Now we know what animadversion, the prince of the apostles, attacked this heresy, having pronounced the first sentence of condemnation against Simon, when he said, Thy money be with thee unto perdition, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. And Pope St. Leo uh, the Great in the Council of Chalcedon in 451 and Can Canon 2 says, If any bishop performs an ordination for money and puts the unsaleable grace on sale and ordains for money a bishop, a corypiscopus, a presbyter, or a deacon, or some other of those numbered among the clergy, or appoints a manager, a legal officer, or a warden for money, or any other ecclesiastic at all for personal sordid gain, let him who has attempted this and been convicted stand to lose his personal rank. That means deposed. And, but, and let the person ordained profit nothing from the ordination or appointment he has brought. He, he profits nothing. He does not get the office. But let him be removed from the dignity of responsibility which he had got for money. And if anyone appears to have acted even as so a go-between in such disgraceful and unlawful dealings, let him too, if he is a cleric, be demoted from his per personal rank, and if he is a lay person, let him be anathematized. Now even apostate anti-pope Innocent II teaches this in the invalid Second Lateran Council of 1139, Canon 1. We decree that anyone that has been ordained simonically, he is forfeit entirely of the office which he illicitly usurped. And so the same thing also, the point we're going to make mainly here is that simony is a heresy. And simony generally is a secret heresy. It's something you keep secret between the one who gives it and the one who accepts it. You don't want other people to know about it. It's secret. But nevertheless, as you just read here, you forfeit your office, you don't get the office. Now we're going to read from the Life and Writings of Sir, Sir Thomas More by the apostate Reverend E. Bridget. It is admitted by all that simony invalidates a pope's election. Could it be proved against him, he would not, strictly speaking, be deposed, but he would be declared never to have been the pope. That's a declaratory deposition, where you're saying he really lost his office the instant he was guilty of simony, or never gained it even if he was being elected to it. Again, if manifest an obstinate heresy were proved against the Pope, a council might declare his see vacant since he would be deposed by the invisible head of the church, the everlasting truth. 
So with secret simony, just like secret heresy even, you could have, you could be, we're going to quote from here too, even from these apostate antipopes, because even though they're apostate antipopes, they are teaching the truth on these two matters. Apostate antipope Julius II is teaching that simony invalidates the election, it's null and void, even if the whole, all the cardinals unanimously elected you and everybody believes you're the pope. If you were elected by simony, you are not the pope. You do not hold the office. This goes against that heresy that some people teach, that if they're unanimously, unanimously elected or, and all the people believe you're the pope, therefore that makes you the pope. That doesn't make you the pope. No, it doesn't. You have to be validly elected, legally elected, and you, and you can't have any obstacles that will prevent you from being elected. And the obstacle in this case is what? Non-Catholics cannot hold offices in the Catholic Church. So if you try to elect a non-Catholic to the office, he doesn't get it. Now, Apostate Anti Pope Paul IV in his Cum Ex Apostolatus Officio, even though it's invalid, still teaches his truth that if anybody is elected to their office by and they're uh, fell into heresy before they were elected, even the Pope himself, both of these teach, even the Pope himself, even the Pope himself, he does not have the office, even if everybody thinks he does. We're going to quote. These two things, you're going to look at them on the screen here side by side. First, we're going to talk about secret simony. Apostate Anti Pope Julius II's Invalid Fifth Lateran Council, Session 5, 1513. We establish, ordain, decree, and define by apostolic authority and the fullness of our power that if the election of the Roman Pontiff is made in any way that involves simony being committed, even if the election resulted in a majority of two-thirds or in the unanimous choice of all the cardinals or even in a spontaneous agreement on the part of all without a scrutiny being made, then, then is this election or choice itself null and does not bestow on the person elected or chosen in this fashion any right of either spiritual or temporal administration so that the one elected is not regarded by anyone as the Roman pontiff. A simonical election of this kind is never at any time to be made valid by a subsequent enthronement or passage of time or even by an act of adoration or obedience of all the cardinals. He doesn't get the office. And simony is a secret sin. It doesn't matter if everybody thinks he's the Pope. He's not. Now we're going to read about the same thing in regards to formal heresy from the apostate anti Pope Paul IV in his Invalid Cum Ex Apostolatus Officio in 1559. We sanction, establish, decree, and define through the fullness of our apostolic authority. If ever at any time any bishop or likewise any Roman pontiff before his promotion or election as a cardinal or Roman pontiff has strayed from the Catholic faith or fallen into some heresy, then his promotion or elevation, even if made in full concord with the unanimous consent of all the cardinals, shall be null, invalid, and void. It cannot be declared valid or become valid through his acceptance of the office, his consecration, subsequent possession, or seeming possession of government and administration, or by the putative, enthr putative enthronement, or of homage paid to the same Roman pontiff, or by universal obedience accorded him by the passage of any time. He's not the Pope. Simon, he's the same thing as formal heresy, so it applies. So even if everybody thinks he's the Pope because he's in a cold heretic, because he holds the heresy in his heart, he is not the Pope. Because God would never allow somebody who's not Catholic and a member of the Catholic Church to have an office in the Catholic Church. Now we're going to talk about apparent office holders who doubt or deny deeper dogmas. We, 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 re, we were reading about that before. That when somebody, when a Catholic, a, a Catholic or a so-called Catholic denies a deeper dogma, he can be either a formal heretic or a material heretic. If he's culpable, he's a formal heretic, and therefore it's certain that he is not Catholic. If he's inculpable because he's invincibly ignorant of the deeper dogma that he doubts or denies, then he's only a material heretic and he's still Catholic. But as I said before, nevertheless, the material heretic must be treated as a formal heretic until he proves his innocence due to inculpable ignorance and he abjures his heresy. You have to treat him as a formal heretic. You have to presume he's guilty. And this is another dog. So that means if he holds an office even and he's holding heresy and he's only a material heretic, you still have to treat him. You have to denounce him as a formal heretic, avoid him in religious matters, and you have to to say he's a non-office holder, you no longer hold the office until he proves to you he's in culpable or ignorance and abjures adjur his heresy. Now, it's a dogma in the Catholic Church that when uh, a, a sinful act is committed by a person, 
Guilt is presumed until innocent is proved. Guilt is presumed. It's the opposite of what we see today in today's legal system where you're innocent until proven guilty. Well, in the Catholic Church, dogma from Pentecost Day, ordinary magisterium and solemn magisterium dogma that you're guilty until proven innocent. Or once you're sure a sinful act has been committed, that you, you have to uh, presume the man's guilty. We're going to read about this dogma. It's contained in uh, canon laws, too. Okay, it's reflected in canon laws. Now, I'm going to be quoting from the 1970 Code of Canon Law and some other commentaries here that are not valid. They're invalid, but nevertheless, they teach this truth. And so we're going to, this is canon 2200 we're talking about. And it says, given the external violation of a law, the evil will is presumed in the external form until a contrary is proved. And we're going to read a practical commentary in the Code of Canon Law by the apostate, uh, Stanislaus y, y word, and this is a commentary on Canon 2200. The rule here stated is evidently necessary for the public welfare. The laws are established, are published by the authorities, and it is the duty of the subject to inform himself of these laws. For the legislator cannot inform each subject individually of the laws that have been passed. The authorities presume, therefore, that a subject knows the law, and if he violates it, he, can, he is considered to have broken it willfully, if he claims to be free from liability, the burden of proof rests with him. Now I'm going to read from a practical commentary in the Code of Canon Law, again, by the apostates Walward and Smith, and their commentary on Canon 2242. If the external act violates the law seriously, a sinful act, culpability is presumed in the external form un until excuse from grave guilt is proved. Contimacy is of the offender is implied. All we're saying, making a case here is that when you commit a sinful act, you're presuming a person is guilty. Now, when it comes down to heresy, and a particular office holder holds a heresy, let's say he, uh, uh, he's denying a deeper dogma, and he's publicly teaching it, it doesn't matter whether he's a formal heretic or a material heretic, heretic as far as the people are concerned. He's teaching heresy. Heresy is corrupting, his heresy is corrupting the Catholic Church, the Catholic faith, and Catholics. It doesn't matter whether he's guilty of it or not. He's teaching it, and he believes in it. All you need to know is that he committed the, uh, the sinful act by believing in heresy, okay? If he's, you have to presume he's guilty. You have to treat him as if he's guilty. We're going to read about this from the Delict of Heresy by the apostate Reverend Eric McKenzie. The very commission of an act which signifies heresy, the statement of some doctrine contrary or contradictory to a revealed and defined dogma, gives sufficient ground for juridical presumption of heretical depravity. There may, however, be circumstances, circumstances which excuse the person, either from all responsibility or else some grave responsibility. These excusing circumstances have to be proved in the external forum. The burden of proof is on the person whose action has given rise to the imputation of heresy. In the absence of such proof, all such excuses are presumed not to exist. When satisfactory proof is offered, the juridical presumption will yield to fact and the person will be pronounced innocent of heresy and not liable to the censure. The preservation of order and the elimination of quibbling excuses makes necessary the provision that where the external delinquent act has been committed, the existence of sin is presumed. Hence, the commission of an act, external act of heresy is presumed by law to have all the necessary qualities of contumacy. Now, that's important because this guy's still poisoning people, the material heretic at his holding office, just like the former heretic. They're both teaching the same heresy to the people. They are both corrupting the deposit of the Catholic faith. Now, the material heretic himself, if he's innocent, then when he proves himself to be innocent, then you pull back your accusation and say, okay, he was not a formal heretic, he's no longer a heretic at all, all right? He was always Catholic and he always held the office. But until then, all you got to know is an office holder holds a heresy. You denounce him as a heretic, you avoid him in religious matters, and you denounce him as a non-office holder. So therefore, if an apparent pope comes out and teaches a heresy, and you're certain he holds the heresy, you denounce him as a formal heretic, you avoid him in religious matters, and you denounce him as a heretical anti-pope who no longer holds the office, he has to prove to you 
that he was innocent because of inculpable ignorance, and he has to abjure that heresy. If he does prove that, then you can say, okay, you really weren't a formal heretic, you actually, you really were Catholic, and you actually held the office. But you don't say that until he proves it. Until then, you've got to treat him the same way as a formal heretic. Now we're going to talk about apparent office holders who are suspect of heresy. When you're suspect of heresy, that means there's no absolute proof that you committed a sinful act of heresy. You, you're suspect of heresy, but you don't have any real proof that the guy really believes in heresy or he's actually a heretic. But you have a suspicion. They have different degrees of suspicion. Light suspicion, medium suspicion, grave suspicion. It doesn't matter what kind of suspicion it is. If it's only a suspicion, it means you do not have absolute proof that he's a heretic or that he holds heresy. In this case, he's, you have to still consider him Catholic. You cannot denounce him as a heretic, and he still holds the office, apparently, until you can prove whether he holds it or not. When a guy's suspect of heresy, he, has to be, he should be challenged. You should bring him to trial if he's not going to listen. You have to actually confront him, and you have to see if he really believes in the heresy or not. And at that point... If you're going to find out whether he, hold, he is a heretic or not. And then if he proves himself to be a heretic, then you've got to denounce him as a heretic, or avoid him in religious matters, and denounce him as a non-office holder if he holds an office. But suspicion of heresy is not enough to be able to denounce the guy as, as a heretic, or to avoid him in religious matters, or to denounce him as a non-office holder. The suspicion has to be proved so that you know he's a heretic, or if he's not, then he'll prove his innocence. Now we're going to talk about putative office holders and putative laws. A lot of people may be saying, well, if we have a pope who's a, a so-called pope, an apparent pope, who's really not the pope because he's, he's a secret form of heretic and everybody thinks he's the pope, isn't that chaos? Because all of his acts are null and void. Because if you're not the pope, everything you do is null and void. It's invalid. It has no force in law. It, really, it doesn't. But to all the people who believe he is the pope and, and they're invisibly ignorant of the fact that he isn't the pope, he's a putative pope. So to them, he is the Pope. Putative Pope, we call it. They have to obey him in all things but sin. All his acts are considered valid and legal, and they have to obey him. And if they don't, they sin. They commit sin. So he's a putative Pope. And all the laws that he makes are putative laws, and all the office holders he appoints are putative office holders. And you have to obey them until you come across proof that he's a former heretic or he's an idolater and therefore he no longer holds the office. Once you get that proof that he is, then you denounce him as a uh, heretical anti-pope. And then you know that all of his acts were null and void. In the history of church, we have many examples where uh, office holders were discovered to be simoniacs or former heretics and, and, and uh, deposed out of their offices and all their acts were declared as null and void. You've, you've even had anti-popes that were never popes from the beginning even when you have schisms and all their acts are declared as null and void. Everything they did, all their laws, all the people that he appointed to the offices are null and void. All right, so if you want, if they appointed people to offices that were worthy, you'd have to reappoint them again if you had knowledge of this. But my main point in here is if you don't have knowledge that he's not the Pope or that your local bishop is not the local bishop, then you have to obey him. He's a putative Pope. You have to obey all his laws. If you don't, you're disobedient, uh, you're disobeying a Pope. Someone who you believe is a pope. And you have to obey all his laws too because you have no reason to believe he's not the pope. It's the same thing when you have a putative marriage. A husband and wife could get married and either a husband or a wife can have an obstacle that's preventing them from validly getting married that she doesn't know about. And so when they get married, they both think they're married, but they're not. That's called a putative marriage. And they're not really married, but they, and they have to act as if they're married. If the husband cheated on the wife with someone else, they, if someone, they would commit adultery because, if somebody cheated, because they're, it's a putative marriage. And, and that's why even when they have their kids, their kids are not considered bastards because they're invincibly ignorant of any obstacle that prevented their marriage from being valid. So their kids aren't even bastards. But as soon as they find out that they're not validly married because the obstacle comes to their attention, they then have to do what's ever necessary to get validly married, or if they can't, then they have to separate. And that's the same thing we're talking about with a putative marriage. So, when you believe somebody is a pope, even though he's not the pope, and you have no information and he's not, you've got to obey him. 
You got to obey him, you got to obey all his laws, just like you would obey any other pope. So it doesn't create any chaos, there is no conflict. The teachings of the fact that uh, he's not the pope because he's a secret heretic is very important when he makes his heresy manifest to you because that's when he starts to really harm the people and that's when you have the power and the weapons to stand against him and say, uh-uh, you're a heretic, you're no pope, your laws are invalid, I'm not going to obey you, I'm going to separate from uh, religious communion with you, and, that, and so it gives you the power to do that. So you don't have to be submissive to uh, uh, somebody who's foisting his heresies upon the public or, and, and, or his notorious immoralities. The next section we're going to talk about here is a pope can be put on trial, judged, and sentenced, otherwise known as juridically judged. But before we teach that, the, this, this dogma that a pope can actually be juridically judged, we're going to have to teach you about the dogma that the apostolic see, also known as the first see in the Roman see, cannot be judged by anyone. That's a dogma. The apostolic see cannot be judged by anyone. Now, the apostolic see is the papacy. Hence, all the valid papal acts are part of the apostolic see and are free from all error and all sin. Papal acts consist of teachings, laws, and judgments. We're going to read from the nominal Catholic Encyclopedia on the Apostolic See. An Apostolic See is any see founded by an apostle and having the authority of its founder. The Apostolic See is the seat of authority in the Roman Church, continuing the apostolic functions of Peter, the chief of the apostles. The authoritative acts of the popes, insomuch as they are the exercise of their apostolical power, are st styled acts of the holy or apostolic see. The see thus personified as the representative of the prince of the apostles. As Pope Leo II's confirmation of the Sixth General Council, which is the Council of Constantinople, 680 to 681, states, Therefore, we also, and through our office, this venerable apostolic see, give assent to the things that have been defined and confirmed them by the authority of the blessed apostle Peter, end quote. And we read from Pope St. Galatius' Epistle 42, or his decreal called De Recipiendis et Non Recipiendis Libris, from 495. And he says, the see of Peter, the apostle of the church of Rome, is first, the first see, having either spot nor wrinkle, nor anything of this kind. So all the valid acts of the popes make up the apostolic see. And all those acts are free from all error and all sin. They're, they're, they have neither spot nor wrinkle. However, any papal teaching law or judgment that is illegal, erroneous, or sinful is invalid, null and void, and thus it is not part of the apostolic see. It is a non-teaching, a non-law, a non-judgment. Hence, the following infallible decree applies only to valid papal acts, and thus not to invalid papal acts. We're going to read from Pope St. Nicholas, and this is from the Roman Council of 816 and 863. This is infallible, chapter 5. If anyone condemns dogmas, mandates, interdicts, sanctions, or decrees promulgated by the one presiding in the apostolic see for the Catholic faith, for the correction of the faithful, for the emendation of criminals, either by an interdict of threatenings or by future ills, let it be anathema, end quote. However, an illegal, erroneous, or sinful papal teaching, mandate, interdict, sanction, or decree is invalid, and thus is no teaching, no mandate, no interdict, no sanction, and no decree, and thus is not part of the apostolic see, and hence must be condemned and disobeyed. God did not give the popes the right and authority to act illegally, to teach heresy or other errors, to make erroneous or sinful laws and judgments. God did not give the pope the authority and the power to do that. We read from Ecclesiasticus chapter 15, verses 13 and 21. The Lord hateth ab all abomination of error, and the Lord hath commanded no man to do wickedly, and hath given man no license to sin. The only papal acts that are protected from error or sin are infallible papal definitions on faith and morals, infallible condemnations of heresies, and infallible condemnations of sinners such as heretics. 
Well, but when a pope is not acting in his infallible capacity, he could make illegal laws, teach heresy and other errors, and make erroneous or sinful laws and judgments. Because these papal lacks are invalid and thus not part of the apostolic see, they must be condemned and disobeyed. Now, even though invalid papal acts must be condemned and disobeyed, the Pope himself cannot be juridically judged unless his papal acts are sinful. In this case, the Pope is not juridically judged as the Pope. When a Pope is judged as a sinner, he's not judged as the Pope, he's judged as a sinner. One proof that a Pope can be juridically judged as a sinner is when he goes to confession. In this case, the Pope's confessor, his inferior, is trying him, judging him, sentencing him, and punishing him when he goes to confession. But as long as the Pope is acting as the Pope and thus not as a sinner, that is, as the supreme judge, he cannot be juridically judged by anyone. This is the meaning of the dogma that the supreme judge cannot be judged by anyone. We're going to read about these dogmas first from Pope St. Sylvester in the 4th century. He states that this is the final canon of a Roman synod. No one will judge the first sea, since all seas desire justice to be moderated by the first sea, nor by Augustus, which is the, uh, the secular rulers, nor by any cleric, nor by kings, nor by the people will the judge be judged. And it was subscribed to by 284 bishops with some priests and deacons and even by Augustus Constantine himself. And we read from Pope St. Nicholas's Epistle 8, and he states, it's called Pro Posoramos Quidem. And, it's, and, he, and this was from 864. And he says, neither by Augustus, nor by all the clergy, nor by religious, nor by the people will the judge be judged. The first seat will not be judged by anyone. When a pope sins, he is not acting as a pope. He is not acting as a supreme judge. He's not acting as a judge at all. Instead, he is acting as a sinner, and thus must be juridically judged as a sinner, just as any other sinner must be juridically judged. However, when a pope makes a non sinful law or judgment, that is illegal or erroneous, he is acting as the Pope, but the law of judgment is invalid, null and void, and thus is no law and no judgment. Hence the law of judgment must be condemned and disobeyed, but the Pope cannot be juridically judged because his illegal or erroneous act was not sinful. Therefore, as long as a Pope is acting as a Pope, as the Supreme Judge, and thus not as a sinner, he cannot be juridically judged. The first C cannot be judged by anyone. Now we're going to give an example of what we were stating right here before. When you have a papal, a pope can make an error regarding a judgment on a, a, a heretic. Uh, a heretic can go to a pope and lie to the pope. The pope could be deceived because he doesn't have the right information. They're lying to the pope. They're deceiving the pope. And he makes the pope believe he's orthodox. So then a pope makes a judgment that this particular individual is orthodox, he's not a heretic. It's an erroneous judgment, but it's not a sin because it's not the Pope's fault. The Pope is inculpably ignorant that the guy's a heretic and the guy's lying to him or he has misinformation. But nevertheless, it's an erroneous judgment. It's a papal act and it's an erroneous judgment, so therefore that judgment is null and void. It is not part of the apostolic see. Therefore, a local bishop who is privy to the fact that this man really is a heretic and he knows that the Pope made an erroneous judgment must condemn that judgment, disobey that judgment, but he can't juridically judge the Pope unless he can prove the Pope sinned in his judgment. So, but what he has to do is resist it, continue to call that guy a heretic, and he has to bring it to the attention of the Pope that the, he made a mistake in his judgment, either because he was deceived or he was given wrong information. So then he has to get the information to the Pope and say, Holy Father, this particular judgment on this, uh, her, this man here is wrong. He really is a heretic, and here's the evidence. Now, if the Pope looks at all the evidence, and he still continues to call the guy orthodox, and doesn't condemn him as a heretic, then the Pope's judgment is not only erroneous, but now it's also sinful. The Pope sinned. And in this case, the Pope becomes a formal heretic for defending a heretic and automatically loses his office. But because he sinned, he can be juridically judged.
And that's just one example of how popes can make erroneous judgments. Now, one proof that not all the papal acts are free from illegality, error, or sin, and that popes can be juridically judged when they sin, is the historical fact that popes have made illegal laws, taught heresy and other errors, made erroneous or sinful laws and judgments, and have been juridically judged. Popes have acted illegally by making secular laws for countries that are not ruled by them. Papal acts that are illegal are invalid and thus not part of the apostolic see because the Pope does not have the jurisdiction and legal right to make secular laws or secular judgments in Catholic countries that are not ruled by him unless they pertain to the Catholic faith or the salvation of souls. Hence, a pope cannot usurp the secular laws and secular judgment, judgments of a Catholic king unless those laws or judgments violate or threaten the Catholic Church, Catholic faith, or the salvation of, of souls. Therefore, any papal secular law or secular judgment for a Catholic country that is ruled by a Catholic king that does not involve the Catholic Church, Catholic faith, or the salvation of souls is illegal and thus is invalid and hence not part of the apostolic see. Now, popes have made erroneous judgments by declaring heretics to be orthodox because of lack of evidence, misinformation, or being deceived by the heretics. We just went over that. Popes have taught erroneous doctrines, which in their days were not yet infallibly condemned. These papal acts are not part of the apostolic seat because they're erroneous, erroneous teachings. Popes have taught heresy in, by their words and their, or their deeds and lost their offices, such as Popes Liberius, Anastasius II, and Honorius. And popes such as Pope St. Hermisdus have taught that popes can teach heresy. Popes and nominal popes have submitted to trials, willingly, in which those who judged the popes were not condemned for doing so. We're going to go over that in here when you're going to see several popes who are judged. And popes have taught that they can be brought to trial and sentenced if any of their papal acts or any acts, other acts are sinful by decreeing the best way to accomplish this which is by a trial held by a universal council of bishops. Therefore, the apostolic see consists only of valid papal acts and thus does not contain invalid papal acts, that is, papal acts that are illegal, sinful, or erroneous. This preserves the apostolic see from any stain of sin or error. And the popes can be juridically judged when they sin as sinners, but not as popes. They're being judged as sinners, but not as popes. That's the only time they can be juridically judged. Now, Canon 21 in the Fourth Council of Constantinople is partly dogmatic and partly disciplinary. The dogmatic part infallibly teaches that a sinful pope can be tried, judged, sent, and sentenced by his inferiors, in this case, uh, by a universal synod of bishops. We're going to read part of this canon first. This is the dogmatic part. This is Pope Adrian II, Fourth Council of Constantinople, 869, Canon 21, the dogmatic part. If a universal synod is held and any question or controversy arises about the Holy Church of Rome, it should make inquiries with proper reverence and respect about the question raised and should find a profitable solution. It must on no account pronounce, pronounce sentence rashly against the Supreme Pontiffs of old Rome, end quote. Hence, a universal synod of bishops can try, judge, and sentence a sinful pope as long as the sentence is not rash. It must on no account pronounce sentence rashly against the supreme pontiffs of old Rome. That means the pope could be brought to trial, in this case, by a universal synod of bishops as long as it's not rash. This then is one proof that a pope could be tried and judged and sentenced, and that's dogmatic proof. Now, in that same Canon 21, before I just read, the first part says, however, nobody else can juridically judge a pope, only a universal council. That's what it comes down to. Uh, but that part of the decree is disciplinary. 
All right? He says no king, no individual bishop, no cardinal, nobody else can juridically judge the pope. Only a universal council of bishops. But that part is a disciplinary law that can change. The proof that the pope can be judged, that's dogmatic. This part's disciplinary. And because it's a disciplinary law, Catholics can be exempted from obeying that part of the law in an emergency situation in which it's impossible to get a universal synod of bishops together to juridically judge the Pope, or they're unwilling to do so. In that case, that part of the disciplinary law, you're exempted from it, and then the next choice, who's going to judge the Pope, would be the Cardinals. They can come together and judge the Pope. If the Cardinals are un unwilling to do it, you can get an Emperor. A Catholic emperor. If he's unwilling, some other Catholic prince. If he's unwilling, some other lesser prelate. If he's unwilling, even laymen could juridically then judge a pope if they have the power to do so. And that's the progression of order that it takes place. And we're going to read about that here from the Protector of Faith by the Apostate Thomas M. Isabicki. The pope, before being brought to trial, should be allowed every opportunity to clear himself of the charges. But the Roman pontiff could not merely dismiss the charges. It was best for the accused to consult responsible individuals, or preferably to call a general council. If the Pope failed to clear himself voluntarily, they can make an oath of innocence, and they can clear themselves in front of the trial, and that, that's sometimes the best way to do it if he's innocent. If the Pope failed to clear himself voluntarily, the Cardinals could demand convocation of a council to inquire into the case. Torquemada could hardly believe that an accused would fail to call a council since a refusal would lend credibility to the charges. If, however, the Pope also refused to call a council, the power of convocation devolved on the cardinals who could, as true guardians of the church, provide for its welfare in such a crisis. The sacred college can confer upon the council's proceedings its own immense prestige. Should even the cardinals fail to act, the power of convocation devolved on the emperor, other Christian princes, or even lesser prelates, for the church's safeguard against papal heresy could not be allowed to fail because someone shirked his duty. And this is a footnote on that. Some extended this power to almost any Christian. So even laymen can do this. If now you have a complete apostasy of the whole hierarchy and none of your secular rulers are doing anything, then a layman could bring the bum to trial if you have power over them. And you can actually juridically judge and sentence him. If no one is willing or has the power to try and sentence a sinful pope, Catholics are still bound to denounce the sinful pope, warn others, and avoid him in religious matters if necessary. If, there were, if this were not so, then an obstinately sinful pope can go on committing his crimes and other sins undenounced and unopposed, and thus do great harm to the Catholic Church, Catholic faith, and Catholics, and cause great scandal. Now, on this particular canon 21 in the Council of Constantinople, it's important to note, we're speaking about a real pope who's being put on trial while he's the pope. However, a pope who becomes a formal heretic or an idolater is no longer the pope, so you're not, this doesn't apply canon to, to that, because they're no longer popes. They're like, they're like uh, they even say in the canons teach, they're, they're as low as any layman can ever be. When a, he falls out of his office, he's no longer the pope, so we're not, this does not apply to a so-called pope, who fall, a pope who becomes a former heretic or idolatry because he's no longer the pope, he no longer holds the office. So it's only, it, this canon's only referring to office holders. Even though the following canons and theologians were apostates and were heretics for presenting the dogma that popes can be tried, judged, and punished for heresy and immorality as an allowable opinion instead of a dogma, they nevertheless do teach this truth. So I'm going to quote from Papal Immunity and Liability in the writings of the medieval canonists by the apostate James Moynihan. The Summa of Stephen of Tornau, this is from the 12th century, Stephen had already stated that a pope could be judged for heresy or schism. Stephen also implies that a pope who has committed not only the crime of heresy, but any notorious crime may actually be brought to trial and condemned. Danger to the well-being of the church is, in the final analysis, the real reason for which a pope can be brought to trial. Certainly a notorious crime committed by the Roman pontiff because of the great scandal and perhaps even loss of faith which it would entail among the members of the faithful could easily be said to harm the general welfare of the church, just as much as crimes of heresy and schism. 
Thus, Stephen, elaborating on this point, to the extent that he made the danger to the welfare of the whole church the ultimate criterion for bringing a pope to trial, would logically have been led to assert that a pope could be judged not only for heresy, but for notorious crimes as well. The Comentum Arte Batense, this work, like the Summa Parensensis and the Summa of Stephen of Tarnot, asserted that the need for protecting the well-being of the church. He first of all asks the question, whether or not a pope who is manifestly guilty of the sin of fornication, and who after being admonished fails to put a stop to his actions, ought not to be accused and condemned by his subjects. He responds in the affirmative. The reason which he offers is the fact that the Pope's perverse conduct is the cause of others straying from the faith. They'll imitate him and think it's not heretical, think it's normal. Obviously, the author merely offered this particular crime by way of example, for he then mentions in passing, as it were, that any manifest mortal sin on the part of a Pope has the same effect, namely, of causing others to stray from the faith." End quote. Now we're going to use a common sense example that I give that proves beyond doubt that a pope can be juridically judged. And even a pagan can know this. You don't even have to be a Catholic to know this. This common sense example I'm going to give you. If you had a so-called pope or a pope that went out into town square in broad daylight in front of everybody and started to rape little boys, took the little boys out of their homes and raped them in front of everybody committing sodomy, and everybody witnessed it. Well, if you believe like some of these heretics do that a pope cannot be juridically judged, he cannot be condemned, nor can he be sentenced or punished, you'd have to let that pope go on every day. And any time he wants going out there, raping one little boy after another in public, because according to these heretics, the pope can never be juridically judged or punished. That's what they would believe. And you know, as a matter of fact, that's happening today in front of our own eyes. We have these apostate anti-popes in Rome who are supporting pedophiles by removing to different locations so they continue committing their crimes. These apostate anti-popes are therefore guilty of sins of omission and association and they are guilty of pedophilia themselves. They're the main propagators of pedophilia. So when you look at these apostate anti-popes, they are raping little boys every day in the town square. For everybody to see, because it's public knowledge throughout the whole world, that these pre there's many prelates raping little boys. We just had a movie come out recently to Spotlight. and won an Academy Award, and I thank God for that movie. Because it's a testimony about how filthy these bastards are. How they continue to let these crimes happen down even till today they're happening. And then when they got that apostate ante cardinal law who was guilty for uh, condoning this and allowing these people to continue to commit pedophilia by not judging or punishing them. They, they rewarded him by sending him into Rome, and they gave him a, a church that he's in right now, and, and, he, and he's not punished at all. So, this example I gave you about a pope raping people in public in a town square applies. It's happening today. Ask yourself, why these so-called Catholics, these nominal Catholics, they learn these things and continue to bring their children to these priests so they can pray upon them. This literally is happening because they've been taught you can never judge a priest, let alone a pope. Don't judge the priest. Don't judge the bishop. Don't judge the pope, let alone juridically judge them. You're not even allowed to condemn any sin he commits, let alone bring him to trial. So therefore, the example I just gave you of this so-called pope out in the public square raping little boys, no one would be able to stop him. If somebody tried to come up and arrest him, they'd say, he could poke and say, you can't arrest me. I have the supreme jurisdiction and authority on earth. You have no power or authority to try me or judge me or punish me. In a case like that even, in that case, because that's a public sin of immorality and it's obstinate, he'd also be a formal heretic and he would have lost his office. That's another issue. But that's what would have happened. But in that case, the only worthy uh, sentence of that uh, punishment for that so-called pope, really, really an anti-pope, a, a heretical anti-pope, formerly heretical anti-pope, is a death sentence. should be killed. Now, if the police are unwilling to do it, and the people in power don't do it, which is what's happening today, and they let it continue to go on, because they, they don't want to judge them, the laymen have the right to do it. It devolves down to whoever has the power to do it. And if a layman doesn't have the power to actually bring them to court, and it's like your kids that are being raped, you would have the authority from God Almighty to kill a bastard. Try to get away with it so you don't get caught. 
But if you, in a moment of righteous indignation, you kill a bastard in broad daylight, God will bless you and reward you. If you sodomize the little boys in public. But according to these people, so you can't judge the Pope, let him sodomize one kid after another. And this has actually happened. Now, this example I just gave you was brought up by the canonists who teach the dogma, although they only teach it as an allowable opinion, but it is a dogma, that a pope can be, uh, when he sins, can be tried, sentenced, and punished. Now we're going to read from the Foundations of the Conciliar Theory by the apostate Brian Tyranny. There was a steady development of this doctrine from the time of Grazian to the composition of the Glossa Ordinaria and eventually a widespread belief that the Pope could be brought to trial and deposed for any notorious crime that gave scandal to the church. Hoguccio presented a long and complex gloss reviewing every aspect of the problem involved in the trial and deposition of a Pope. Most important of all, he posed the very pertinent question of why heresy should be mentioned as the one crime that could be brought against the Pope. And in reply, he quoted the generally accepted opinion that heresy in the Pope was particularly injurious to the Church as a whole. Hoguccio, however, did not agree that heresy was the only crime of the Pope that was likely to injure the whole Church. And he went on to present a catalog of the most heinous offenses that could occur to the 12th century bishop. Notorious fornication, robbery, sacrilege, was all this to be tolerated in a Pope? And he gives a Latin quote here on this. In Hoguccio's view, to scandalize the church by contumacious persistence and notorious crimes was tantamount to heresy and could be punished as such. And that's what I teach. When you, when you commit public acts of immorality obstinately, that's not just immoral, it's also heretical. Because you're telling people this is normal, there's nothing wrong with it. If, you're, if your pope is publicly committing adultery and everybody knows about it, he's not trying to hide it, that's not just guilty of a mortal sin of immorality, it's also a form of heretic. Johannes Teutonicus held that a pope could be deposed for any notorious crime and for heresy, even if it were secret. Now we're going to read from Papal Immunity and Liability in the Writings of the Medieval Canonists by the Apostate James Moynihan. Hoguccio says, I believe that in the case of any notorious crime, the pope who is guilty of such may be accused and condemned. If having been duly admonished, he refuses to reform. Continuing his arg argument, he exclaims, What? Suppose that the Pope should publicly commit a theft, publicly commit fornication, publicly keep a concubine, publicly have relations with her in a church, even close to the altar, and suppose having been admonished, he should continue to act in this way. Does anyone mean to say that such a Pope ought not to be accused, ought not to be condemned, to scandalize the church in such a way is it not in itself heresy? Besides, contumacy is equated with the crime of idolatry and is quasi-heresy as seen from, here's a quote, a quote from Grazian's decretal. And, and one who is contumacious is already a pagan. Therefore, he concludes, a notorious crime presents the same situation as the crime of heresy. The other example I give, he came close to it. He didn't, I'll go further. A pope who says mass on the so-called Pope on the Lord's Day, and he fornicates on the altar during Mass. Well, according to the people who believe the Pope cannot be juridically judged, sentenced, or punished, they'd have to let him do it. And if they want to go to Mass, they have to look at it, and, they'd have to, and they can't do anything about it. As soon as somebody tries to get up there and say, Holy Father, you know, you're immoral, you're a mortal sinner, you're a former heretic, you're a sacrilegious blasphemer, they'd shut him down. Shut up! You can't judge the Pope. You're his inferior. Shut up! You can't even say that about him, let alone rip him off the altar, arrest him, and kill the bastard. That's what the, so what would you have to do then? You'd have to go to Mass every Lord's Day, and, because that's your local church if you're going there, and you have to watch that happen day after day. And, you know, the laymen are taught not only just about uh, idolization of the popes, about the whole priesthood. They're taught to, they say you can't judge any priest even. So it, it's not just the pope thing because you say he's the highest of the church. You, they're not even allowed to judge priests or bishops or anybody. But technically, according to the people who believe a pope can never be tried, sentenced, or punished, that pope could continue to fornicate right on the altar, and nobody has the power of jurisdiction to actually to get rid of him, to, to declare him deposed, to be deposed already, because that's formal heresy also, and to kill him. 
That should be death penalty. You can give him a chance to repent if you want, but, he, but you depose the bastard as a declaratory sentence and you put the death sentence down upon him. Now the next part of evidence is popes or, and anti-popes who, who have been juridically judged, have been tried, sentenced, and punished if they were guilty, and if they were found in, in, innocent, they were let go, and they were declared to be innocent. Now, I'm not going to give you the information on the, I'm just going to mention their names. You have to go to my book to read about what took place during these trials. But one thing is common in all these trials. The popes submitted to the trial. They understood that it was legal, that it, it can happen. And some of the popes who were innocent were able to take an oath of innocence, like Pope St. Leo III, and he cleared himself. So no, no, they didn't have to bring forward witnesses, but he did submit to the to the trial, and then he took an oath of innocence, and that cleared his name. And he was some popes actually had to go to trial, and they were found to be innocents, that the accusations against them were rash, were false, and it proved itself in the trial. Other popes were brought to trial, such as Pope uh, John XII, he was an anti-pope, really, a, a formerly heretical anti-pope. He was brought to trial and found guilty of notorious sins of immorality and sins of idolatry and heresy, and he was deposed. So, I'll just give you a list of some of the popes that are in the book. Pope St. Marcellinus, who committed an act of idolatry and was judged by a council of bishops and he abjured. Pope St. Damascus was brought to trial. Pope St. Sixtus III was brought to trial. Pope St. Symmachus was brought to trial. Vigilius was tried even though he didn't show up to his trial and was deposed by the Emperor Justinian and the bishops and, uh, who consented to it. Uh, Pelagius, Pope Pelagius was tried. Brought to trial, Saint Pope St. Saint Leo III was brought to child, trial, Pope Leo IV was brought to child, trial, and Pope John XII was brought to trial. And none of the people that actually brought these, tried these popes or, or sentenced them or let them go were ever accused of committing any type of crime saying, hey, you're not supposed to judge the pope. So they, always, they understood what the meaning of the first seat cannot be judged by anyone, as I explained in here. As long as the pope is acting uh, validly and his papal acts are not uh, illegal, erroneous or sinful, they are absolutely 100% free from all error, must be obeyed or part of the apostolic see. But if not, then it's not part of the apostolic see. They must be condemned and disobeyed, and when a pope sins, he must be juridically tried, sentenced, and punished. And when he commits any sin, like anybody else, let's say it's not a big sin, he still has to go to his confessor. And that's a trial where you're being sentenced and you're being punished. Okay, so this is the end of the lecture for this season. Let everybody get rid of their papal idolatries. All right, which is uh, causing a lot of them to continue to stay in the, un, refer to these monsters, these absolute horrible monsters as popes and holy fathers. And like I said in the beginning of the lecture, if after you look at all this evidence and you see all these crimes they're committing and you dare still to, and now you have this evidence that they're not popes and you don't want to take this evidence, there's no hope for you. No hope whatsoever. Don't call us. Don't write us. Don't speak to us until you accept it and call these people apostate anti-popes or heretical anti-popes. End of lecture. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.